go live button. So we're going to wait for the stream to fire up across the internet. Looks like Facebook is going to be allowing us to play today. So that's very nice. And we're also waiting for Periscope, which my understanding is they're going away. But we're always waiting on YouTube and it looks like we are live. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the r and Law Group in the always beautiful and sunny Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, over the course of many years, have represented thousands of good people facing criminal charges. And throughout our time in practice, we have seen a lot of problems with our justice system. I'm talking about misconduct involving the police. We have prosecutors behaving poorly. We have judges not particularly interested in a little thing called justice. And it all starts with the politicians, the people at the top, the ones who write the rules and pass the laws that they expect you and I to follow but sometimes have a little bit of difficulty doing so themselves. And so that's why we started this show called Watching the Watchers, so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency back down upon our very system with the hope of encouraging some meaningful change. And we are very happy and grateful that you are here with us today because we're uh, sort of wrapping up what looks like to be the impeachment trial. The impeachment proceedings are coming to a conclusion as we speak. And so we're going to go through some of today's events, uh, specifically talking about the Trump's defense team. Today was all Trump defense, and there wasn't really that much of it. Uh, they were they had 16 hours to go through the entire defense case, and they kind of wrapped it up in like two and a half hours, I think. So right now they're in the middle of uh, asking and answering questions. The senators are sort of asking questions and Trump's team and uh, and the House managers are responding to that. So we're going to go through today's events and then we're going to try to sort of chime in and see exactly where they're at. We may even have a vote before the end of this broadcast is over. So we'll see how long this goes. We may be sort of going through the news and then checking back in before we get to the live chat because they may be concluding it right now, literally as we speak. We're also going to today take a little bit of a break from some of this impeachment stuff because there was a Supreme Court case or Supreme Court ruling that came out late last night at about 11 p.m. And we have a little bit of an inkling where the newest judge, Amy Coney Barrett, where she is going to be ruling or at least leaning when it comes to a death penalty case. So kind of an interesting case that I want to run through with you today. A guy named Willie Smith is on death row. He was scheduled to be executed here shortly. And then suddenly the Supreme Court stepped in and said, nope, can't do it. And we want to explain why, because it is a, a kind of a interesting issue there. And then near the end of the broadcast, our final segment, we're going to talk about, of course, Kyle Rittenhouse. Kyle Rittenhouse had a bail hearing yesterday, and there was a little bit of a kerfuffle between the prosecutor and the judge and one of the uh, one of the alleged victims. They actually were arguing about the word victim. So one of the alleged victims fathers. Uh, got very upset about the mask situation going on there. So we have a clip of that. We're going to play at the end of the broadcast. A little bit of a, a little bit of a spicy exchange there in court. So we want to share what that looks like. Before we dive into everything, I want to invite you to go ahead and subscribe to our channel if you have not already done so. We go live at this time every weekday, and we're going to be going live tomorrow actually, it's sometime in the afternoon, to talk about our digital bill of rights. And so we want you to be a part of that. We'd love it if you liked the the, the video, commented, shared it with a friend or family member, and invited them to join us. That'd be very much appreciated, just to help get that message out there a little bit. As a, as a reminder, we're going to go through some slides. Look at some primary source documents, the Supreme Court ruling. We're going to look at a video from Kyle Rittenhouse. If you want access to all that stuff, it's in the slides available over on locals.com slash watching the watchers. It's a different platform. We post most of our sort of non-video content over there. So we'd invite you to go and check that out. All right. So that's it for me. Let's get started with an analysis of the impeachment. As we've been doing when we've been talking about the impeachment, I have liked to have uh, sort of give you both sides of my take on the day's event. So today, of course, is the final day, uh, unless this spills over into tomorrow, this was Trump's defense presentation. So we had several different attorneys today on the floor of the Senate, and they didn't spend much time getting into things. They, it was only about two and a half hours. If, if I could be mistaken about that, but it was short. Uh, they were allotted 16 hours of time. They got it done in about two and a half hours. And I want to just run through some of the good and the bad. In the preceding days, we've done this with the Democratic, with the House managers, their presentation. I've done my best to say positive things and say negative things that I think are within bounds. And so I want to do the same thing today with Donald Trump and his team. So let's get into the good and the bad. Then we're going to revisit 
the same flow chart that we've been working through, then we're going to get into the news. I want to talk about some of the issues that have, have come up today and as well as sort of how the Trump team has narrowed the scope of their defense again. So the Democrats are really trying to expand the scope and what Trump's defense lawyers did is really narrow it back down and then they introduce some of their sort of stop blocks, their defense markers. And so we'll go through all of those things. So first and foremost, the good and the bad. Some of the good things that Trump and his team did, the first one I thought was very good is they showed this incitement language double standard. So they played a lot of clips, a lot, a lot of clips, a lot of uh, compilations that the media is not happy about, but I thought were very effective in showing that there's this massive double standard when it comes to defining what incitement means. The Democratic claim thus far has been Donald Trump use the word fight like hell or you're not going to have a country anymore. Use that phrase. And that was something that was in the original article of incitement. We talked about it. They also said we want you to, I think there was another one, something about fighting. They were, they were very upset about certain language that was in his Save America rally speech on January 6th. That was in the original article. The scope was very narrow and they were upset about that language. And so today what Trump and his team did is they had this many, many, many clips of all spliced together in sort of these super cuts where they would just go through and they would show other Democrats, other politicians, other anchors, other, uh, you know, Congress people, people just sort of in the political sphere, all using very similar language. And it was very effective, I thought, in showing that this was this is kind of just commonplace language. This is standard political language. And it was persuasive in my mind. I think a lot of people thought it was very, very effective, myself included, because they were saying the same things. And when you see Hillary saying it and Kamala Harris saying it and Chuck Schumer saying it and on and on and on and on for like seven minutes, 17 minutes, 14 minutes here and there. You're going, all right, right? It, it just adds some context to what Trump said. They also did some other good things. They showed that there were due process problems that were in the evidence that was submitted by the Democratic House managers. We've got a clip of that from one of Trump's attorneys, and we're going to show you sort of how he made that argument. I thought it was very effective, specifically talking about due process. In other words, this entire impeachment trial and the underlying lack of an investigation. There should have been an investigation that took place in the House of Representatives before it ever came over to the Senate. And they were just really sort of ripping that apart, that it just did, it wasn't done right. And then the evidence that was submitted yesterday by the House managers was sort of falsified. It was sort of fraudulent and it was subpar evidence, which is the same point that we were making yesterday. They also made a, a good a free speech defense. I thought it was very good in, in terms of uh, just going it back to the originality of the First Amendment, you know, the Democrats were trying to make this little bit of an argument I thought was intellectually dishonest. And I was disappointed about it because I, I believe in the First Amendment very strongly. And what they were saying yesterday is that, well, free speech is great and all, but it doesn't really apply in an impeachment proceeding. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, the Constitution, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law regarding the and then we talk about all the First Amendment protections in there and somehow the Democrats were reading that as though, well, it's OK if it's an impeachment proceeding that you should not consider or you should have rules or regulations or laws or the, the case law that says how do you interpret speech in an impeachment proceeding should support not protecting that free speech. Just didn't make much sense, especially since they uh, swore an oath to the Constitution, to uphold and defend the Constitution. So uh, what what we saw today from Trump and his defense team, I thought was effective. They did actually cite some case law. It actually was sort of a good, and you're going to see it as a bad below because the presentation of the defense, I think for most of the public was probably pretty boring where right? he was talking about case law. He was going through some of the, the legal analysis that came from those cases. And even I, when I was listening to it, I was like, okay, you know, I'm a, I'm a legal guy. I like to listen to this stuff just in general, but I'm thinking to myself, all right, you know, this is very pertinent, but it is more boring than some of the other stuff that we have seen. And so kind of a good, kind of a bad. They also did not volunteer evidence to the senators, which I thought was a very a, kind of a smart play. Uh, may not be so good in, in the court of public opinion, but I thought from a legal perspective, I thought it was very good. And we're going to see what I'm talking about here. I have a clip from this. It was just actually recently asked this afternoon. One of the, I think it was Bernie Sanders, in fact, actually asked about 
a asked a question. I don't know if I have a clip of it yet because I just watched it, but it, Bernie Sanders asked a question and it sort of got contentious. And one of Trump's lawyers was, was responding to him and basically saying, it's, it's not relevant here. I'm not going to answer that. It's totally not relevant. And it's a good, you know, it's a good question if you're not in a trial. It's a good question. It should have been asked during an investigation, which should have taken place in the House of Representatives before the day of the trial. But the trial was today. They get to ask clarifying questions. They don't get to do an investigation in the middle of a trial. And we'll talk, we'll dive into that a little bit more. And another good thing I thought in terms of legality, a good legal strategy was they kept it very, very short. And you'll see this down here. I think it's also something that's bad. The reason it was good is because I think they probably made a good calculation that this was not good for them. This was not good for Republicans. This was not good for Trump. The longer this thing went on from a defense perspective, the worse it was. And they wanted to get it done and get it over with quickly. I also thought it was good because they know that they're going to win this thing. They know that the Republican senators are not going to cross the aisle and vote to convict Donald Trump. So why would you sort of... Uh, belabor the point why would you let this thing go on and on and on and just drone on when all that's probably going to do is just agitate some of your jurors and you want them to rule in your favor so they just said okay enough we presented our case you heard our our points they kept it short sweet and concise and they are just moving on with it so that was why that was good now let's talk about the bad as I mentioned, I thought that some of the legal procedural arguments are boring. I mean, they're just boring. So you got to think about the two audiences here. Some of the arguments that we heard from Trump and his team were lawyerly arg arguments. They were for they would they were the type of arguments that you would present to a judge. When you're presenting to a jury, you don't go in there and you talk about case law and you know statutes and and, and citations and and you know sort of navigate through the legal analysis in front of a jury because they're not lawyers. Their eyes would glaze over; they'd be bored out of their minds. That's why you get into emotional arguments and you get out there and you do what the Democrats did yesterday and the day before that. You talk a lot of emotion and you blow everything out of proportion and you make everything seem like it's the end of the world. We we saw a lot of that, a lot of doom and gloom, a lot of look how close Pence was, look how close Romney was, look how devastating this is to American democracy. And that's persuasive. It's effective. It's a lot more interesting. People will be more engaged versus another lawyer who comes out and says, well, in Woods versus, uh, you know, Smith, there was this thing that they talked about and the court said this and they analyzed these five factors and it goes on. A guy like me, I'm like, yeah, that's great. This is this is this is substantive legal analysis. But you got to remember, this is a trial in the Senate. It's a political show trial, in my opinion, and it's something where the American people are watching this. So they're not making arguments to the judge. They're not even really making arguments to the senators so much as they are making arguments that the media is going to run with and the American people will ultimately decipher as, as it comes through the media filter. So, you know, in terms of, I, I think, making a solid legal case, it was very effective. But in terms of winning in the court of public opinion, I thought not so good, not so effective. The clips also were very repetitive. We saw a number of clips that were just sort of, you know, stacked together. And we saw some of the same clips, I think, replayed a few times. I think I heard from Hillary a couple times. I also heard from Chuck Schumer, the same actual uh, uh, clip that we used to impeach him in our impeachment template. He that was played a few times, I think, at different parts throughout the presentation. I think a couple different attorneys played it. So a little bit repetitive. You know, it's not the end of the world, but it was it, it would have been, I think, a little bit more effective. I noticed it. I think other people probably did as well. There was also some pretty aggressive posture at times from Trump's attorney. And actually, Jonathan Turley posted this on Twitter. He flagged it. And I saw this. Uh, we have a clip from, I think it was Vanderween, one of Trump's defense attorneys, Vanderween, who was really getting agitated about it. And I think a, a question was just read into the record and he responded. He goes, Who's, who asked that question? Wondering what senator had actually asked that. And Bernie Sanders, to his credit, fired right back. He goes, I did. That's my question. What do you have to say about that? And then Vanderween just turned around and said, well, listen, basically it's outside the scope. You know, it's a relevant question. And the question had to do with, uh, I think, did you think the election was stolen? Do you think, does Trump think the election was stolen? And he goes, who asked that question? And then Bernie, I did. And he said, well, that's irrelevant. We're not talking about that. We're talking about incitement. Okay, that's the scope of, of what we're talking about here. I know you guys want to talk about everything else, but that's not the point. Okay, that were, the scope is limited to the article of impeachment and to, to, the, to the issues in front of the court. And so it was a little bit contentious. You know, I'm not so sure that 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 is an effective thing to, to, to sort of do with a room full of senators. These people are already egomaniacs. They already think that the whole world is beholden to them. And so to have some, you know, podunk attorney in their minds come in there and 
sort of give them some attitude, I'm not sure that that fares real well. But as I said, you know, I don't think that this is something where that type of behavior would ultimately impact the outcome. And so right now you're also thinking of that, that, that uh, attorney's posture as being a political statement. You know, right now he's doing that probably to make his client feel good, right? To go out there and say, you know, being, being more aggressive to make sure that Trump is watching the performance and is happy with his posture. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned, where it was, where I said it was a good thing that it was kept very short. It was good legally. I think probably not so good publicly, right? The public was probably expecting a lot more we saw yesterday basically two full days. I think the Democrats used 14 of their 16 hour allotment. Trump and his team, they used two and a half hours, right? And so if you were somebody on the other side, you may have been expecting a lot more. You may have been wanting to see a, a, you know, a point by point rebuttal and you may have wanted a lot more meat and potatoes around the bone. And we just didn't see that there. So, you know, from a, from my perspective, I thought it was a good thing that it was short from a tactical legal perspective, but in the court of public opinion, you know, it may have been better to just continually dunk on the Democrats if, if they had more material to do that or to answer more questions, if they weren't going to be dunking on the Democrats to just sort of, you know, be a little bit more open and responsive to additional questions. You know, that, that, again, I think that's a public a, a PR public relations type of question. I still think that on the weight of things, keeping it short, and moving on was a better decision. All right. So let's take a look at the flow chart that we've been working through. As I mentioned at the start of this impeachment proceeding, if I were a prosecutor, this is sort of how I would prosecute the, the, uh, the impeachment against the president. And these red blocks are the stops. These are the defenses. And largely we saw a lot of this stuff. We saw, they didn't refer to it that I heard of by the Brandenburg test. But the defense to the incitement was, well, Donald Trump didn't, it was an incitement. I mean, it wasn't technically or legally incitement. We heard some, uh, some law read into the record, but really this was rebutted by some of the videos that they played that basically Trump's language is the exact same language that other Democrats and other politicians and other anchors have used. Therefore, it's not incitement. It's also benign political speech, which sort of carried over, which is a, it's a separate issue, but political speech in terms of the the First Amendment defense yesterday, we saw a pre rebuttal from Joe Negussi, and he was saying, well, you know, free speech doesn't apply in impeachment proceedings. And today they had a pretty forceful sort of justification that free speech is included. The Supreme Court has said that the you know, they actually referenced, I think, two cases uh, into the record. So I think they did a nice job of buttressing that that you know Trump was utilizing free speech. We also saw that there was some talk about causation. In other words, Trump did not ultimately cause this. There was premeditation. This was stuff that would have happened even if Donald Trump uh, you know, had not said those words. We talked a little bit about that. And then sort of negligence. We kind of talked about that just in terms of kind of what the other Democrats have been doing and saying. In other words, the entire volume of the political environment is so elevated that it's 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 damaging from both sides, right? The government is kind of being negligent. And they ran through, they talked, I think, about Mayor Bowser, and they said, well, you know, there, other people who were in charge of making sure the Capitol Hill was secured, they were negligent. They were refusing additional help from federal resources that would have been there to provide additional security to prevent something like this from happening. And, you know, largely it kind of followed that same structure. They did it very rapidly. We saw a lot of video, a lot of media, good use of media today. And as we have been experimenting with yesterday and the day before that, I also wanted to mention the scope. So remember the scope that we left on yesterday. When I talk about the scope, specifically, we sort of start in the middle with the article of impeachment and we were adding in a lot of the other issues that were not in the original articles, but the Democrats wanted to talk about and they just packed that full in their 74 page memorandum. Then yesterday we saw even more stuff was crammed in the scope, specifically issues about Russia, China, you know, Trump's, Trump's going to do this again. We saw, you know, MAGA is dangerous for the foreseeable future. And it just sort of looked like this. We started here in the middle, then the Democratic memorandum really buttressed the the, uh, the sort of the additional issues and expanded the scope. And then yesterday we saw that again. Well, Donald Trump and his team today, they just got rid of all that other stuff. They really spent a lot of time talking about these two questions. You know, we won by a landslide, which the Democrats are calling the big lie. And 
also, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. So they, 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 I didn't see much about the Raffensburger phone call, um, a, a little bit about it, but most of the time was spent here. And this, these were some of the main claims they used to sort of put the stop signs in the road. They really wanted to get aggressive. They said no due process here. There was no causation. It was not actually incitement and it really was free speech. And so let's get into the, the happenings that took place today. Now that we have sort of a framework on where we're coming from. And when I was, if you, if you recall, earlier in the week, we were going through the Washington Post updates. We were literally, they have this update, this live update panel. And I took this screenshot today and it was very, very wild just to see the tone of the change in how this stuff is being reported by the Washington Post. I went back to the Washington Post. We've been using them all week and I wanted to go back and use them today. But the nature of the coverage has just been 100%, in my opinion, adverse to Trump, right? So now they're saying Trump team shows selectively edited videos of Democrats urging a, a fight. And this is very interesting, the selectively edited video part, because what we're going to see here in these upcoming slides is one of Trump defense, one of his defense lawyers claims here was the Democrats were selectively editing their videos. And so he actually made this whole point. He had a whole presentation about it, that they were not presenting the full context of the things that were being said. They were selectively edited. And so he actually had as part of his presentation today, an argument that they selectively manipulated the evidence that they were submitting to the trial. And so the Washington Post turns around and says, no, you were selectively editing it. So, you know, you see just a lot of language here that we didn't see yesterday when the Democrats were presenting, the headlines were very much in their favor. Here today, you'll see things like, uh, well, first of all, they think Tucker Carlson is going to be a major threat to democracy. Now we also see, you know, we got sort of a sympathy story, you know, story, uh, look, look what Trump did. Two officers are dead. 199 legal experts say the Senate must not acquit. We've got, as I said, selectively edited videos down here. We have, uh, democratic senators pan Trump's defense arguments, plainly a distraction. They say Trump lawyer defends former president's phone call with Georgia secretary of state. Trump did not cause the riot, says his lawyer. And then they add in this little blurb who doesn't mention the ex-president's invitation for his supporters to come to dc right so they they say oh it, it's a little bit of reporting but then they just add a whole argument here oh by the way trump said that he didn't cause the riots but he didn't mention that he invited them down to dc by the way you're going come on can you just report what's going on or do you have to add in your little commentary every step of the way so let's take a look at what washington post has on there right now this is live Lawyers conclude their case. Senators ask questions. Trump lawyer dismisses the claims as hearsay. Very much concerned about Pence. Raskin asks, how gullible do you think we are? Trump lawyer declines to say whether or not they won the election. Republican senators are targeting wavering colleagues. So, you know, a lot of the same tone. Fight was just a political speech, his defense team says. All right, so let's go back to our slides. And this they were very upset about this selective editing video, the selective selective editing issue that came up today. This was from the Washington Post earlier today at 143. Lawyers for the Donald Trump team concluded their defense after conclusion after House impeachment manager. I'm sorry, after accusing House impeachment managers of being motivated by hatred for Trump and showing selectively edited video of Democrats using the word fight as they sought to downplay the former president's role in the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The defense lawyers who also argued his speech was protected by the First Amendment allotted 16 hours for their presentation, but only used two hours and 32 minutes. And then senators would get the opportunity to ask questions. So as I mentioned, uh, there, there are a couple headlines throughout the internet, uh, so, some other postings on Twitter. People were upset about this selectively edited video because it was very effective, I think. And this was interesting that they, they sort of use this word. Uh, they, they're pretty good at this. They'll do this a lot. They'll say that something that you did was was wrong even though they they did it or they'll, they'll take something that was effective from you and they'll sort of manipulate the argument and they'll say no that was wrong so here I'm, I'm being inarticulate about this here's the point one of trump's lawyers made the case today made an argument on the senate floor in the trial today that said uh, basically they were submitting fraudulent evidence to you okay they added a blue check mark where there wasn't a blue check mark they were manipulating dates they were taking certain videos out of context and so as soon as that presentation was over they played a separate uh, video that did have a bunch of selectively edited did clips. I mean, we got to be candid about that, but it's not any different than what the Democrats did yesterday. And so what the Washington Post reports is, well, Trump and his team, they use selectively edited videos. 
they're not even reporting the fact that the entire argument was about the Democrats using selectively edited videos. And so they're saying that Trump and his team were doing something improper, but their the basis of their argument was that they did it first. And so it's just a, the massive double standard continues. It's almost comical if it wasn't so serious. But here is Trump's you get lawyer more today. Than this when you fight a parking ticket. One reason due process is so important with respect to evidence offered against an accused. Hey, so quick, quick note on that. I did speed this up rapidly. It's at 1.75 speed, but uh, he, he, he slows down a little bit and I think you'll be able to understand it. You get more due process than this when you fight a parking ticket. One reason due process is so important with respect to evidence offered against an accused is that it requires an opportunity to test the integrity, the credibility, the reliability of the evidence. Here, of course, former President Trump was completely denied any such opportunity. And it turns out there is significant reason to doubt the evidence the House managers have put before us. Let me say this clearly. We have reason to believe the House managers manipulated evidence and selectively edited footage. If they did, and this were a court of law, they would face sanctions from the judge. Yep. I don't raise this issue lightly. Rather, it is a product of what we have found in just the limited time we have had since we first saw the evidence here with you this week. We have reason to believe that the House managers created false representations of tweets, and the lack of due process means there was no opportunity to review or verify the accuracy. Consider these facts. The House managers, proud of their work on the SNAP impeachment, staged numerous photo shoots of their preparations. In one of those, manager Raskin is seen here at his desk reviewing two tweets side by side. The image on his screen claims to show that President Trump had retweeted one of those tweets. Now, members of the Senate, let's look closely at this screen, because obviously manager Raskin considered it important enough that he invited the New York Times to watch him watching it. <laughs> now, what's wrong with this image? Actually, there are three things very wrong with it. Look at the date on the very bottom of the screen on manager Raskin's computer screen when we zoom into the picture. The date that appears is January 3rd, 2020, not 2021. Why is that date wrong? Because this is not a real screenshot that he's working with. This is a recreation of a tweet, and you got the date wrong when you manufactured this graphic. You did not disclose that this is a manufactured graphic and not a real screenshot of a tweet. Now, to be fair, the House managers caught this error before showing the image on the Senate floor. So you never saw it when it was presented to you. Yeah, so you know, in, in a court of law, that, that is a big deal, right? In a real court, that's a pretty big deal. Unless, unless something happens, if you, if you catch the other side manipulating evidence, you might say this is pretty minor, but if you're, but if you're literally changing dates and recreating evidence and it's not the, uh, the original thing and you're not disclosing that to the court, that's a huge problem. I mean, massive problem. Uh, there would be a big issue with that. So people are up there saying, well, it's just the date they recreated it. They just moved some things around. It's Photoshop and everything like that. That's kind of the point, right? Is, is there is no legitimacy or credibility behind any of the evidence that was presented. It is just stuff that is being manipulated. It is just the Democrats moving things around. Now, it may be minor, it may be inconsequential in, in their perspective, but this is not how things work in a regular court of law. You don't just get to go to a judge and say, oh, yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I kind of swore under oath that that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it's an exhibit. I'm testifying to the court that this is true and authentic. I know where it came from. I got a good chain of custody. I can prove it all. Uh, we can backdate it. You know, we can we can verify where it came from. We can authenticate the document. I just manipulated it a little bit. Sorry about that, judge. And the judge goes, oh, it's just the date. You're just moving some text around. No problem. Never would happen. That would be a big, big problem. And so he rightfully points that out. Now, it wasn't just with that one clip. He also says that there were some house manager that said that this woman's uh, t a tweet that which was presented in front of the house is Jennifer Lynn Lawrence. They gave her this blue, this blue check mark. Okay, well, in reality, she doesn't have that. She does not have a blue check mark. So why are they doing that? Why are they manipulating evidence? And again, you may say it's just a blue check mark. It's it's kind of a big deal, right? They're trying to make her her claim look more legitimate than it than it is. Okay, I I don't necessarily agree that a blue check mark makes something more legitimate, but that's why it exists. But that's why people get it. It's verified. It looks more prestigious. That's why people go through the whole process of getting one. And so for them to manipulate the evidence like that, it's manipulation. And if you can manipulate one bit of evidence, who's to say they didn't manipulate other bits of evidence? Same story here. So that attorney just went on and he had two examples. I'm not going to play the video clips here, but they, they, he showed specifically, he said he sort of had these two videos playing side by side. And he would. this was from the fine people hoax where they, uh, this was sort of one of the biggest, you know, crocs of baloney that I've ever seen. But they were saying that Trump was racist based on this video clip where he was saying, you know, there were, quote, fine people on both sides of the aisle when he said, I totally disavow the Nazis and the white supremacists and all that stuff. Well, when the House managers played their video, they cut it off. And so he, he starts in this, he plays this video and he says they stopped right here when when uh, when you, know, you have good people on both sides, which is what he said. 
they stopped it right there. And he just played the rest of the video where Trump finishes his thought and said, look, I condemn them totally, but you got to understand there, they're good people who do think that taking down a part of governmental history is a problem. He says the Nazis, the white supremacists, I condemn them totally. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the other people. He says, what are you going to do? Take Washington down? You're going to take Jefferson down? And so they took the whole thing out of context. In other words, they selectively edited the video and he just came back out and he said, look, this is this is exactly what they did. He made the same point over here where he says that the house managers cut the video here where basically there were, there were several cuts in this video. So they were clipping from Trump's speech over to the crowd speech and to Trump's speech and over to crowd speech. And he was just showing that things were selectively edited going back and forth. And then as soon as he's done presenting it, what does the Washington Post do? They, they, they make a post and they say, Trump and his team were selectively editing videos. You're going, oh my, did you guys watch it? Because he was just accusing you, your team of doing that same thing. Uh, of course, I, I say that the Washington Post is on the side of the Democrats based on their political commentary for how they cover the news. So there, there is, you know, there is a concept in the law called the doctrine of completeness. I want to show you what that looks like. This came over from Cornell Law School, the Legal Information Institute. Under Rule 106 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, and this is for civil procedure, I'm going to show you what one, uh, Rule 106 looks like here in a second. It says, when part of a writing or a recorded statement is introduced, an adverse party may require introduction of any other part or any other writing or recorded statement which ought in fairness to be considered contemporaneously with the writing or recorded statement originally introduced. This additional evidence is called explanatory evidence. Its purpose is to qualify, explain, or put in context the original piece of introduced evidence. The explanatory writing does not have to be part of the same writing or recording. Additionally, even otherwise inadmissible evidence such as hearsay can be admissible under this rule if it is necessary to correct any confusion or wrongful impression created by the admission of the original evidence. Okay, so these are things that we talk about in the law. Here is actually rule 106. It says specifically very short rule. If a party introduces all or part of a writing or recorded statement, an adverse party may require the introduction at that time of any other part or any other writing or recorded statement that in fairness ought to be considered at the same time. And so, you know, it's, it's a rule. This has been thought through before, this selective editing argument. And in this trial, both sides are doing it because nobody's really following any rules. It's just a political bunch of nonsense. There is, there is rules and procedures for this. The Democrats selectively edited videos yesterday. That was a part of Trump's actual argument. They played evidence about that today. And you know, in a regular trial, the Democrats would have never been able to play what they played. The Republicans or Trump and his team would have never been able to play what they played because it's all hearsay, incomplete evidence. It's all political nonsense. The whole thing is a joke. It's not following any rules. But now the double standard is coming back into play. Now the Washington Post and other people on the Internet are saying this was selectively edited. They did something so egregious when the entire crux of the argument was that, hey, you guys did it first. So that they were very upset about it. It, it They're still very, very upset about it. This is a portion of, the, I think it's a minute and 42 seconds. I'm not sure we're going to listen to the whole thing. But this is what they were upset about. This is the video itself. They're fighting, or I'm fighting, we're both fighting. We will fight back. We're not going to just take this line down. I'm just going to keep the fight up. What we have to do right now is fight as hard as we can. We have to rise up and, and fight back. And so we're going to fight and we're going to continue to fight. I'm going to be fighting. I am like hell. We keep fighting, 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 or we kept fighting and we did. So we're going to keep fighting. We have to be fighting every, every single day. We have to fight back. And we have no choice but to do that. I think we're doing the right thing to do that. Uh, fighting. And I'm fighting. Well, our job right now is to fight. It's really important. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm asking for the support of people across the country to fight back. And you got to be fierce uh, in uh, fighting. Keep fighting. Brown have been fighting. I've told President Biden I will fight like mad. I'll tell you what. Now, more than ever, we have to fight like hell. We have these battles on the floor of the Senate. I'm going to go down okay. and battle. And, uh, and I'm going to be down there on the floor fighting. Right. But we do. Democrats are fighting as hard as we can. Democrats are fighting as hard as we can. Credit it in any way, but we're fighting back. What we've got to do is fight in Congress, fight in the courts, fight in the streets, fight online, fight at the ballot box. Fighting and pushing around the clock, fighting, continue to be brave and be strong and keep fighting. We're getting people engaged in the fight. We're fighting. We've got to keep fighting and keep focused. Continue to fight. Fight. Uh, this is going to be a fight. We'll also fight him and challenge him in every way that we can, in the Congress, in the courts, and in the streets. To continue fighting. We each have an important role to play in fighting. In this fight, like so many before it, it has been a fight. The American people are going to have to fight. And about the importance of fighting, I will always fight. Fighting. But we always must fight. Joe Biden has a deep, deep-seated commitment. 
to fight and to fight and about the importance of fighting. We always must fight to fight to fight and to fight as our willingness to fight continued the fight, as Joe Biden says, to fight. It's about fighting for what we're fighting for. We Yikes, right? I mean, it just went on and it went on for like another 10 minutes. I think that one, I, I, there were so many of them. I think one went for 13 minutes, five and seven minutes. I mean, it was a lot. And they just had just clip after clip after clip. And this, what you know, there were some other really good ones in there. They had one where I think Elizabeth Warren went on and on and on. Hillary Clinton was in it. There was a whole nother segment like that about stolen election, challenging the election, about objecting to the electoral votes. Even Raskin was back there in 2017, objecting to the votes. We had uh, uh, the other one woman, uh, I can't remember her name right now, but a lot of people were doing it back then in 2017. It was like supercut after supercut after supercut. And in my opinion, just extremely effective. A lot of people on the conservative Twitterverse were just uh, sort of doing cartwheels over it. I wasn't as uh, over the top as some some individual, I don't think, but I thought that this was this was particularly well done. And it, it didn't it didn't it, it didn't sit well. They were pretty upset about it. You can typically tell how how the Trump side did based on, I think, how the response, what the response from the media looks like. And the Washington Post was obviously very aggressive in their, in their version of reporting the facts of today. It was a lot of uh, political commentary wrapped into their headlines. And they were sort of making the argument against Trump's defense lawyers in their reporting. So that's that that's how you know it's effective the other way that you know it's effective is because uh so suddenly the calls of racism are out there so you just watch that video there was chuck schumer there was cory booker there was uh who else was there was a lot of other people in there right a kind of a whole slew of individuals there white people black people males females a lot of democrats throughout the ages have used that type of language we saw you know uh, joaquin castro who's a hispanic man and on and on and on but Stacey Plaskett today, one of the first questions that she asked or one of the first issues she brings up is that it was a lot of black women and a lot of people of color. So as soon as the argument starts to get away from her, it's just like an automatic defense to just suddenly just shout racism towards Trump. Trump has been accused of racism for four and a half years, five years now, longer than that. And so her response to the defense is that the defense is racist by playing this video and the defense, they work for Trump. So obviously they have to be racist, right? Well, here is Stacey Plaskett on the floor of the Senate today. The defense counsels put a lot of videos out in their, um, in their defense, playing clip after clip of black women talking about fighting for a cause or an issue or a policy it was not lost on me as so many of them were people of color and women, and black women, black women like myself, who are sick and tired of being sick and tired for our children. Incitement. Your children, our children. This summer, things happened that were violent. But there were also things that gave some of us black women great comfort, seeing Amish people from Pennsylvania standing up with us, members of Congress fighting up with us. And so I thought we were past that. I think maybe we're not. Honestly, I have no idea what the heck she's even talking about. Uh, so apparently she's trying to equate what happened with the Capitol with stuff back during the summer unrest. And, uh, you know, I guess Trump playing a video to respond to the Democrats playing videos, they can't they can't include black women in their videos or what? I mean, I don't understand what the point was. I think it was just a bizarre excuse to talk to make this a racial thing. I don't know how it became a racial thing, but everything is a racial thing these days. So the other big complaint that I saw from a lot of people on the left today on Twitter was that. Uh, Trump and his team didn't know how to respond when they asked him about when he knew that Mike Pence was in danger. So a lot of these questions, we've, we've, I've been critical about this throughout the, throughout the week, really, is what the Democrats have been trying to do is make this whole thing about the harm and the damage and about after the fact. Right. As soon as the Capitol was breached, look at all the chaos. Look at all the damage. Look how close they were to getting Pence. Look how close they were to getting Romney. We got it. 
Well, what does that have to do with the cause of that madness? We're therefore incitement of an insurrection. Okay, so we got to figure out what caused that. And they really weren't talking about it. Today, they were bringing up questions about, well, when did Trump know about Pence and what did he do about it? And to their credit, Trump's de uh, defense lawyers, they just turn around and basically say, it's not relevant. What, it's not relevant. The, d the Democrats haven't presented any evidence about that. Ask them when the timeline was. So we'll get into this. Let's listen in on what happened on the floor. Exactly when did President Trump learn of the breach of the Capitol? And what specific actions did he take to bring the rioting to an end? And when did he take them? Please be as detailed as possible. The House managers have given us absolutely no evidence the other on to that question. Uh, we're able to piece together a timeline, uh, and um, it goes all the way back to de December 31st, January 2nd. There is a lot of interaction between um, the authorities and um, getting folks to, to have security beforehand on the day. We have a tweet uh, at 2.38, so it was certainly some time before then. Uh, with the rush to bring this impeachment, there's been absolutely no investigation into that. Uh, and that's the problem uh, with this uh, entire proceeding. The House managers did zero investigation, and the American people deserve a lot better than coming in here with no evidence, hearsay on top of hearsay on top of reports that are of hearsay. Due process is required here. And that was denied. Mic drop walks away. Look at that. Love it. Beautiful. So he's exactly right. He's 100% right. Here, you know, this would be similar to like, Let's say you're in a murder trial and they haven't proven that your client did anything. They haven't, they, ha they haven't been able to prove it. They go to trial, the trial's coming to a close, and uh, one of the jurors or one of the prosecutors in this case, somebody who was there, somebody who you know is going to vote to incriminate your client, they ask, okay, well, uh, defense lawyer, where did uh, your client hide the murder weapon? Do you, is he willing to share that? And you go, you go telling you anything. It's not our job to tell you to help make your case. You had several weeks to prepare your investigation, to do your due diligence. You didn't do any of it. Now you're coming in here and you want to ask us questions about facts, about what Trump did. That's not what this proceeding is for. You could have held a commission. You could have held some sort of inquiry. I think Nancy Pelosi was calling for a, you know a, an anal a, some sort of a, a investigation that was analogous to the 9-11 commission. And they had all the, they could have done that. They didn't do that. Now the day of trial, they're saying, hey, where's the murder weapon? What did he do after that? Um, we're kind of struggling over here. Can you give us some more evidence that maybe we can use over here so we can get back on track? And his attorney, rightfully so, just said, no, we're not, we're not talking about it. There's no due process. He said the House impeachment managers haven't told us anything. Go back to them. Ask them. They're the investigators. They're the prosecutors here. They're the one who want the impeachment to happen. They should figure it out. Ask them. And then on Twitter, everybody's saying, I, I can't believe this. Donald Trump and his attorneys didn't, they didn't respond to that. They're not going to answer the senator's questions. No, they're not. The defense doesn't have to do that. We are defense attorneys. We don't have to help the government in their case. They can get the evidence and they can bring it forward. If they can't, then sorry, tough luck, figure it out, right? That's how this process works. And so a lot of these legal scholars, these armchair lawyers out there are, are just sort of throwing their hands up in the air. This is just, this is just typical. Donald Trump is such an evil person. He's not even going to give us the dignity of answering questions. No, folks, it's a trial. Uh, that's it. Bring the evidence or don't. You had plenty of time to do it. You wanted to rush this through. There really was no due process, as his attorney mentioned. And so tough luck. They don't have to answer any of those questions. And good for his attorneys for sticking to that. All right. So a recap on everything. Good was they really, I think, decimated the incitement stuff. Uh, a lot of those clips were very damning. It's obviously political language. There was no incitement. It's protected by political speech. All very, very good. There were due process problems, as we just heard. A lot of evidence was sort of uh, manipulated. It was all reports on reports. We saw documents being submitted from CNN as, as evidence, apparently, even though 
they were written right after the fact. There was a story about Officer Sicknick being killed. They introduced that as evidence, as a, as a footnote in their memorandum. Now they can't bring a case. They can't prove that case, it looks like. They may be able to later down the line, but they said he was murdered with a fire extinguisher because he had a huge gash in his head. That was evidence in their memorandum, and that's just not fact. It's not a fact and evidence anymore. So no, no real due process, no real investigation. They did a good job of not giving in to the senators. I could see attorneys just saying, you know, a different strategy of saying, well, I'm we're, we're, yes, Senator, I know it's an important question. We're going to answer that for you. They didn't. They just said, sorry, tough. That's not a good question. Uh, go ask the House managers about it. And so it's mostly done at this point in time. I thought a very effective day for Trump and his team. Let's take a look at the Washington Post yet again to see where we're at, see if we have any news on any of this. Tensions rise as senators question Trump's lawyers. Let's take a look at the New York Times, see what they've got. Trump wraps up the brief senators complete question setting up a likely Saturday vote. So we'll get we'll get into that tomorrow, it looks like. So that was it for Trump's impeachment defense team. Largely effective day. All right, so let's change gears a little bit. We're going to leave the impeachment stuff behind, but we are going to stay with the federal government. This story is from the SCOTUS blog, the Supreme Court of the United States. They had a late night ruling last night that is uh, basically precluding a an execution from taking place. This article came from Amy Howe, and the document is titled, Court Won't Allow an Alabama Execution Without a Pastor. And so we're going to go through this late night opinion that came out very late last night. It's actually an interesting case. Let's go back to the article. It says, on Thursday night, the Supreme Court ruled that an execution of an Alabama man must remain on hold. Unless the state allows the man, Willie Smith III, to have his pastor by his side in the execution chamber, the justices rejected a request by the state to undo a ruling by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, which had blocked the state from executing Smith. So it sounds like Willie Smith is on death row and he is being scheduled to be executed. He wants his pastor to be there with him when they go into the uh, the execution chamber. And Apparently, it sounds like in Alabama, that was not allowed. And there is some some uh, interesting history there. So it's not allowed. He appeals up to the 11th Circuit. The 11th Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals for the Alabama state, they say, we are uh, we, we actually agree with your appeal. We're not going to let them execute you without your pastor being there. So the 11th Circuit is also foregoing, it's, it's putting the execution on hold. So the state of Alabama then, the government, appeals up to the Supreme Court. Now they're both arguing about whether or not this execution should go forward without a pastor, without a spiritual person there. And so Smith, so we just have some context here. They, uh, he, was a, he was sentenced to death in 1991 for a robbery, a shooting death of a 22-year-old person named Sharma Johnson in Birmingham, Alabama. So we'll talk about the the law there, how the justices are holding in a minute, but a little bit of backstory here. So apparently in Alabama, the way that this worked is some time ago, I don't have the dates in mind, but in a different era in Alabama, they had some rules on the books that said, if you were on death row, if you were going to be executed, then you would get a pastor to come with you, but it had to be a Christian pastor who was hired to work at the prison by the state. Okay. And so they had a position for that. They had a Christian pastor, somebody who helped death row inmates, right? Or other people. And this was an employee for the state government. And so what ended up happening, of course, you can see how that can get messy. Now you've got sort of a commingling between a you know, religion and the government. That's, of course, a big no-no, separation of church and state and all those concepts. So what they did in Alabama or what a different actual inmate did, somebody who was also on death row, is they said, hey, uh, I'm, I'm Buddhist. So I want a Buddhist whatever practitioner in there with me when I go in, you have a Christian person, but I'm Buddhist. I don't want your Christian pastor. And so they were challenging that. And so what Alabama did is they just said, all right, that's fine. You, you don't get a pastor at all. Then no pastors at all. I think they, I think they sort of modified it a little bit over time. They added a Muslim person, you know, a Muslim uh, pastor, whatever the, the proper vernacular is for that. And they allowed that. And then the Buddhist said, well, I still don't have mine. And so they just said, all right, enough of this already. Nope, nobody gets any pastors. And now this guy says, well, I want my pastor in there. So let's take a look at what the judges have to say about this. Four justices, Justice Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Amy Coney Barrett. What? One of these things just doesn't belong here. 
That's because Stephen Breyer, Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan are all on the left wing of the court, and Amy Coney Barrett is on the right wing of the court, apparently. So what is Amy Coney Barrett doing with these left wing judges? Well, let's see if we can piece some of this together. All signed an opinion that was ultimately written by Kagan that said the state failed to adequately justify its policy of barring spiritual advisors from the execution chamber. In other words, the state can't justify that not having a pastor there is is worth it, that it serves a legitimate government interest. Three justices, so the Chief Justice John Roberts, Justice Thomas, and Brett Kavanaugh, they indicated that they would have allowed the election to go forward under Alabama's policy. And then we have two unknowns, Judge Alito and Judge Gorsuch. They did not publicly disclose how they voted, but at least one of them must have voted with the three liberal justices and Barrett in order to prevent the execution from occurring without a spiritual advisor. And so right now you've got... You've got four who are affirmatively in the majority. We know who they are. And you have to have another person in there to make it five. So you have a sort of a five, five, three for sure. Could have been a six, three, or could have been a five, four. We don't know because uh, two judges, Alito and Gorsuch, haven't told us how they voted. And this is allowed in this type of a proceeding. This is a, um, I forget what they call it, sort of like a, a um, uh, the words on the tip of my tongue, but it's like a, it's a it's a very quick proceeding because it's an emergency type of uh, endeavor uh, was happening in Alabama required an instant response late last night because the execution was forthcoming. So uh, so we don't know how, how they voted, but we do have the opinion that we can read through. So let's take a look at it. As mentioned previously, these were the judges who voted in the majority. So they are responsible for this opinion. Justice Thomas is not on this list because he would have granted the application. So he would have uh, allowed the execution to go forward. The application here is the government asking that the Supreme Court b grant an injunction and demand the, the the lower circuit court remove the requirement that they allow the pastor in. So it's sort of layers on other layers. But Justice Thomas is not in this box. This box here could have been Alito or Gorsuch. We just don't know who it was. So as we can see here, it's Alabama versus Smith. And this is on the application to vacate the injunction. Thomas would have granted the vacate the order to vacate the injunction. And then we have Kagan over here. We've got Breyer, we've got Sotomayor, and we have Amy Coney Barrett, and we have our mystery person. They're concurring in the denial of the application to vacate the injunction. So there's there's the language for it. And so let's go through this. It's not a long piece, and these are actually pretty quick to read because a lot of it's sort of a case law and citations that you can just skip over. Willie Smith, he's sentenced to death. His last wish is to have his pastor with him as he dies. The Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, applying a statute that was designed to protect a prisoner's religious rights, required Alabama to honor that request. I concur in the court's decision to leave that order in place, and I write to explain why. Alabama has not carried its burden of showing that the exclusion of all clergy members from the execution chambers is necessary to ensure prison security. So you got to see a relationship there between what the government is claiming they're doing this for, allegedly it's prison security, and they're saying that they have in order to, pr to ensure prison security, we got to make sure we don't let a pastor in the execution chamber. I think right off the top, you think that doesn't make much sense, right? It doesn't sound like it passes the gut test a little bit. So the state can now ex cannot now execute Smith without his pastor present to ease what Smith calls, quote, the transition between the worlds of the living and the dead, right? Which is, which is, pretty profound. The governing law sets a high bar for Alabama to clear. There's a uh, an act called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which provides expansive protection for prisoners' religious liberties, which is a good thing. Under that statute, a prison may not, quote, impose a substantial burden on a, pr on a, re a prisoner's religious exercise unless doing so satisfies our strict scrutiny test which is a very high test. It's sort of the highest threshold that we have for government laws. The challenged policy must be, quote, this is the strict scrutiny test, the least restrictive means of furthering a compelling governmental interest. So you would just do your analysis on that. What is the compelling governmental interest? Well, according to the government, it's prison security. And what's the least restrictive means of furthering prison security? Well, according to them, it's not allowing a pastor into the government, in, in, into the execution building. So part of the analysis, is there any other way that they can make sure the prison is secure that allows a, a prisoner to have their spiritual advisor with them as they die? Probably, right? I think we could probably come up with something. Let's see what the court says. That 
I'm sorry, if any less restrictive means is available for the government to achieve its goals, then the government must use it. So, so is, there any, is there anything else that the government can do to make sure that the place is secure while they have a pastor joining in? I think so. It goes on. Alabama's policy substantially burdens Smith's exercise of religion, right? He doesn't have a pastor when he dies. That's a big deal. The state bars all clergy member from the execution chamber, leaving inmates to die without spiritual attendance. But Smith understands his minister presence as integral to his faith and essential to his spiritual search for redemption. His pastor, his pastor Smith says, will not only relieve his struggles as he passes, but also help him properly express to God his repentance. The sincerity of those religious beliefs is not in doubt. Alabama acknowledges that Smith's request is, quote, based on a religious belief and not some other motivation. So, you know, they're, they're, they're believing him. Brief for the dependent. Uh, so they, they cite some law. Alabama's policy must withstand strict scrutiny. So, again, what is that standard? The least restrictive means of furthering a compelling government interest. And they say the court says it cannot. Prison security is, of course, compelling. But past practice in Alabama and elsewhere shows that a prison may ensure security without barring all clergy members from the chamber. Until two years ago, Alabama required the presence of a prison chaplain at an inmate site. It gave up the practice only when the court barred states from providing spiritual advisors of just one faith. So once they had to include other faiths, they just stopped doing it. Still more relevant, other jurisdictions have allowed clergy members with no connection to the government to attend an inmate execution in the last year the gov the federal government has conducted more than 10 executions attended by the prisoners clergy of choice in exactly what smith requests some states have chosen to follow the same practice nowhere as far as i can tell has the presence of a clergy member whether state appointed or independent disturbed an execution that records suggest that alabama could satisfy its security concerns through a means less restrictive than the current prohibition and so they make the argument that that needs to happen the state however is arguing differently they're saying Alabama, the state, you know, why, why can't they have a pastor in there? They're saying they need to close the execution chamber to all but those whom the warden has found, quote, trustworthy. That does not justify the state's bar, according to the court. Alabama can take any number of measures to ensure that a clergy member will act responsibly during an execution. The state can do a background check. It can interview him. It can talk to his associates. It can seek a penalty-backed pledge that he will obey the rules. What the state cannot do, however, consistent with the strict scrutiny standard, is simply presume that every clergy member will be untrustworthy or otherwise said that only the harshest restriction can work. Relatedly, Alabama also says disturbances have arisen around executions in the past, but its two examples concern close family members of inmates, not pastors. The state cannot jump from dissimilar incidents to a conclusion that even well-vetted clergy members risk disrupting an execution. Again, the state fails to recognize the law places a heightened duty on prison officials to demonstrate, not just assume, that a plausible, least restrictive alternative would be ineffective, where their preferred approach burns religions for these reasons. The 11th Circuit was right to bar Alabama from executing Smith without his pastor. By his side, the law guarantees Smith the right to practice his faith free from unnecessary interference, including at the moment the state puts him to death. Interesting. Interesting, 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 right? This is sort of a religious protection opinion coming from the left wing of the court. And the conservatives are not there. The conservatives are, well, one of them is there. We don't know who that is. Could be Gorsuch or Alito. But Amy Coney Barrett, as we all know, very, very strong Catholic. She's joining in on that, saying, yeah, pastors should be there. So Breyer, so are Sotomayor, so is Kagan. And somebody else. Now, what do the conservative people say about this? This is interesting, right? Normally, the conservatives are, are thought to be the protector of religious freedoms. But they're on the other side here. They're saying Willie Smith should have been executed. Let's take a look at who is on that side. The Supreme Court of the United States. This is Judge Kavanaugh dissenting. Judge Kavanaugh is right here. You also have Thomas, who's not a, not a part of this dissenting opinion. But we saw from the very front, from the very first part that he said here, he would just vacate. He would just grant it. Okay, he would just grant the application. He didn't write anything about it. He just says, yep, I just grant it. So we're going to put him on the pro-execution side along with the conservative judges. And here it says, Justice Kavanaugh, with whom the Chief Justice joins, dissenting in the denial of the application to vacate. This is a short opinion, so we'll just go through it quickly. In 1991, Willie Smith murdered Sharma Ruth Johnson. The execution was scheduled for tonight. Smith asked to have his spiritual advisor in the execution room. Alabama said no under its policy of excluding all spiritual advisors from the execution room as distinct from the viewing room. The 11th Circuit enjoined the execution, stopping the execution, stating that the state's policy likely violates the law. 
because the state's policy is non-discriminatory and, in my view, serves the state's compelling interest in ensuring the safety, security, and solemn, solemnity, 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 I don't know how to say that word, of the execution room, I would have granted the state's application to vacate the injunction. Respecting, okay, but the court has different view and denies the state's application given the stays of execution here. And in another case, it appears that the state, to, it appears that states that want to avoid months or years of litigation delays issue, they should figure out a way to allow spiritual advisors into the, into the execution room as other states and the federal government has done. Doing so not only would satisfy the inmates request, but would also avoid still further delays and bring long overdue closure for victims' families. So, uh, so it sounds like he's not opposed to allowing it to happen. He's just saying the state, in other, in other words, Alabama should probably go back and look at this thing again, but in this case, it's okay. We'll, we would just, we would allow it because it's already been going on for a long time. This happened back in 1991. The family needs some closure and we don't, you know, they have a system in place that is already not biased. Okay. It's a, it's, it, you, you may disagree with the rule. According to this opinion, you may disagree that there should be no pastors in the room with you when you pass or with that person when they pass, but it's applied uniformly, right? It's not just Christians. It's not just Muslims or Buddhists. It's everybody. Nobody gets one. And so they're saying, well, that, that serves a pretty compelling interest. It does ensure the safety, does ensure the security, does ensure the solemnity <laughs> of, of the execution room. So uh, I'm going to look that word up as soon as I'm done here. All right. So um, we are, so who, where did they vote? Who voted where? Here we've got uh, Judge Gorsuch and we have Alito. We really don't know who voted with whom, but they are, uh, they, they could have split it. One could have been with the majority and one could have been with the minority and uh, one, uh, or they both could have been in the majority. We just don't know, but we know one of them joined in on it. If I had to guess, if I had to take a stab at it, I would say that Gorsuch voted with the majority to stop the execution and Alito didn't. What do you think about that? What do you legal scholars think about that? Interesting case. Ultimately, what's probably going to happen is, yeah, he's going to be executed and he's going to have a pastor in there. We'll see what happens. All right. So let's change gears yet again. Where are we? Okay. Kyle Rittenhouse had a bond hearing, a bail hearing very recently, and there was a little bit of a spicy there. There was a little bit of a back and forth between the district attorney, a guy by the name of Thomas Binger. We also had a, quote, victim whose father was in the room, and he got into it with the judge about this mask, taking his mask off, says, Kyle's not taking his mask off. I'm not taking my mask off. And the judge said, come on, man. And so it was kind of a, an interesting little back and forth. There was also some conversation about whether to increase the bond or decrease the bond. And Kyle came out on top in this one. Much credit to his attorneys. Let's go into the article. Law, I'm sorry, where did this come from? So this came from NBC Boston and then lawandcrime.com. One of their reporters was uh, going through the entire hearing. So we actually are going to kind of uh, skim through what the transcript looks like. And then we'll look at that video at the end. So here is from NBC Boston. It says a judge on Thursday refused the prosecutor's request to issue a new arrest warrant for 18 year old from Illinois a guy by the name of Kyle Rittenhouse. We've talked a lot about him. He's accused of killing two people during a police brutality protest in Wisconsin. The, the circuit judge, Bruce Schroeder, rejected the prosecutor's request for a $200,000 bail increase for Kyle Rittenhouse. Remember, Kyle's already on a $2 million bond, so the prosecutor wanted to up that from $2 million to $2.2 million because of this change of address problem. And uh, I was pretty critical about this, actually, last time. If you recall, something happened where we went through the case record and we were looking specifically about what happened. But when Kyle was arrested or when he posted bond originally, typically what happens in those proceedings is you sign some documents or your attorney does, or an attorney explains to you when you're signing those documents that you've got release conditions. And one of those release conditions is you've got to update your address. You got to tell the court where you're at. If they don't know where you're at, that's a, that's a big problem. And your avowal to the court, your promise to the court is, is it's your obligation to keep that. You got to notify the court of where you're at and all those things. So when the prosecutor's office, when the court mailed something to the address that they thought was Kyle's, it was returned undeliverable. It got bounced back to their to their court, like literally in the mail, undeliverable. And they go, uh-oh, we don't know where he is. So they sent an investigator over there. 
went over there, found that he had moved and that there was a new resident there. The resident came out, showed a mail. Look, it's my address. I forwarded my mail. I'm living here. And so they went back and reported that to the prosecutor's office. Prosecutor's office, very unhappy about that, said, all right, this is a huge problem. We're going to want to increase the bail so that they could take Kyle back into custody. He's got to go find another 200 grand. They say he was violating his release conditions and all of those things. Now, is it the end of the world? No, but it's a pretty big problem if, 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 you're, if you are Kyle Rittenhouse, right? It's a, it's a huge problem. If the judge, the judge could have easily gone the other direction and said, yep, you're right, this is, uh, this is totally inappropriate. You're going back in and raise that bond. That didn't happen, though. It says here, according to this article, Mark Richards, one of his attorneys, wrote in a filing, it is of concern to the defense that any information regarding Kyle's location being publicly available would result in immediate harm to the Rittenhouse family. So they're talking about this as a security thing. Binger refused to make a deal, saying the defendant's address is public record. So he wants it public. Rittenhouse's attorney supplied Schroeder with Rittenhouse's current address in a filing on February 3rd with a request that it be kept secret. Binger said the address is just a post office box. That is completely unacceptable, Binger said, he wrote in his reply. And we're going to see, we're going to see from Binger here. This guy's got a bit of an attitude. And in my opinion, my humble opinion, judge sides with Kyle Rittenhouse in the defense request for a secret safe house address, refuses to issue a warrant for rearrest or increased bail written over by Aaron Keller at law and crime. They do a good job of covering a lot of these court proceedings. Judge Bruce Schroeder was unimpressed by Binger's pleas to know where Rittenhouse was located. Schroeder said he doesn't know quote, where international business defendants are located. They are allowed to leave the country as they please while their cases continue, he suggested. And he noted that his, his border county of Kenosha frequently allows defendants to cross into neighboring Illinois unless a judge places a restriction on the defendant. No such restriction was placed on Rittenhouse, the judge noted. To issue a warrant now for a defendant who's appeared at every hearing, I'd be breaking the law, Schroeder said. Schroeder said the bail was not merely, quote, a privilege. Bail is a right. He referred to the Constitution. He agreed Rittenhouse wasn't completely square with the court. If he'd have left a forwarding address, that probably would have been full compliance. We're interested in an address where we can send notices for hearings. So he's in violation, the judge said, technically. But he noted that he's never jailed a defendant who, while appearing with court, said his address on file needed to be updated. So this judge is being pretty down the middle. He says, we amend their address on records. They might be barked at a little bit for violating the court's argument, but that's all that happens. Schroeder failed to acknowledge the difference between a defendant appearing in court and updating an address with Rittenhouse's situation. So the court suddenly learned that Rittenhouse wasn't at the address he provided because they got that undeliverable mail. The judge said he couldn't recall a defendant's bond amount ever being raised, which is what the prosecutors requested for Rittenhouse. Never, ever being raised, said the judge said. So why are the prosecutors asking for it right now? I'm going to deny the motions, Schroeder finally rolled, ruled. Right? And so the judge is making this distinction between appearing in court and updating an address. If he would not have gone to court, if he would have missed a court date, yeah, that's a huge, huge, huge catastrophic problem. Issue a warrant, go get him, and maybe not grant any other, another bond. Hold him non-bondable. But that wasn't it. Okay, he showed up for the next court proceeding. Everybody knew where he was. The prosecutor didn't know he was, and the court didn't have the address updated. So this judge, I think, is being very reasonable here. He says, I do think, I understand the concern. My heart goes out to everybody involved. This is a terrible thing, especially to those listening, the families of those affected. Schroeder said he wanted the case handled peacefully, fairly, and impartially. He said he also feared for the safety of the defendant. I don't want any more problems. The police don't need any more problems. We don't need people's safety in jeopardy in any way. He noted that the courthouse windows and doors were still boarded up after the ghastly event known worldwide as the Kenosha protest. He agreed that defense with Rittenhouse's defense that his address should be kept from public scrutiny. Then the judge ordered the Rittenhouse team to provide ex exact physical location of his place of, ab of abode to the clerk quote to keep it privately to be given to me to be given to whomever the sheriff designates as the commanding the person responsible for, for full knowledge and whereabouts of the defendant and that is to be kept secret by the sheriff's office Rittenhouse attorney said he would provide the address by 5 p.m central time less than 2 p.m after the hearing the district attorney though asked that his office be given the secret address <laughs> Judge said no. He ordered that the DA's office deal with the sheriff's department if it really needed the address. Binger said he needed to know Rittenhouse's address in case he filed additional charges. We've never been denied this information in any other case, Binger told the judge. This is highly irregular, Binger said, citing his office's legal duty to enforce Wisconsin laws. We cannot do our job without his, this information. Judge said the sheriff can keep on top of this, right? If you want to charge him, talk to the sheriff about it. Rittenhouse's attorney, Mark Richards, shot back at any future charges could be sent to his law office, obviously, and that Rittenhouse would be in court the next day. 
we accept charges for uh, on behalf of people regularly. It's part of, it's part of the, the nice thing about having an attorney is you don't have to deal with that stuff on your own. Thomas Binger knows that. He knows he's represented by counsel. He's making this, this pitch for the address for who knows what reason, just out of spite, just because he's so mad. Richards then accused the DA of posturing after the core ruling had been issued. Binger tried arguing that the sheriff's jurisdiction wouldn't extend to Rittenhouse's presumed whereabouts in Illinois should a problem arise. Schroeder shut down the hearing without responding. So it got a little tense in there. The hearing was contentious from start to finish, and we do have a clip of it. Binger's underlying complaint was that Rittenhouse wasn't on the hook for any of the $2 million bond. It was somebody else's money. The judge doesn't care. <laughs> We've got the cash here, Schroeder said. Judge says, yeah, it's, in, it's, in the, it's right here. We're looking at it. $2 million bond. He posted it. Binger tried to bring the argument full circle by saying the bail, which was provided by others, would not ensure that Rittenhouse would appear at future hearings or ensure he wouldn't flee. This prosecutor or something. Neither he nor his family would suffer consequences, he said. Schroeder said he'd looked at the statute, which we also have here, which he referenced as Wisconsin Statute 96903. A subsection of that statute allows a judge to, quote, place restrictions on the travel association or place of abode the defendant during a period of release, which is just very standard stuff. Schroeder said he usually only applied the statute for people accused of, for example, a fourth drunk driving incident. You didn't ask for that at the first appearance, and Judge Keating didn't order it, Schroeder told the prosecutor. Therefore, Schroeder said there was no order for Rittenhouse to live at the address he provided in Antioch, Illinois, in a previous proceeding. Binger refused refocus Schroeder on a different statute, 969.10. And that statute says a person who has been released on bail or other conditions shall give written notice to the clerk of any change in his or her address within 48 hours after the change. The statute reads, this requirement shall be printed on all bonds. Binger admitted that the difference between the two statutes, which the judge noticed, was an important distinction. He then pivoted in this extremely serious case. The court should want to know precisely where Rittenhouse lived at all times. All right. Binger pointed to that moment, however, to the defense admission that 9610 requirements were not being followed. Binger also said the defense should have filed a motion to keep the address secret rather than act unilaterally. Schroeder said the statute doesn't require Rittenhouse to live at the address he provided absent a separate order under 96. So they're getting really deep into some of the statutes here. Binger said the court could revoke Rittenhouse's bond under another law, but he didn't believe he could meet the requisite legal burden to seek that solution. Binger wanted Rittenhouse bail raised and wanted him rearrested until he could raise the additional money or remain locked up. This guy is going hard after Kyle. The judge referenced another section of the law, which might allow Rittenhouse to be otherwise sanctioned, but Schroeder said that that didn't apply to the situation either. either. Binger was missing missing several key facts necessary. And it just keeps going on and on. Arguments veered into demands. Schroeder wanted a trial to maximize the possibility of fairness. Another, uh, this is where it got good. John Huber, the father of Anthony Huber, whom the judge refused to allow anyone to refer to as victim, we have this clip, also spoke. He accused Rittenhouse of relishing being a killer, thinking he was above the law, enjoying the, quote, media circus. It's not like his mom and dad put up the family house to get him out. He has nothing to lose if he runs, Huber said. He's going to spend the rest of his life in prison, and there's justice in that town of Kenosha. The kid, we don't know where he lives. You don't know where the, he lives. Nobody in the court knows where he lives, Huber added, which is not true. The judge just said he did. If he's got all this backing, what is he afraid of? So it's just an angry father who's very sad that he lost a son. We can have some sympathy for him. Why does he need to be in a safe house? Huber asked him. His bond should have been $4 million, like I said from the beginning. We lost a son. How would you feel if a killer of your son is able to walk free, make videos in bars, and live it up? He's in pain. He's got to spend all kinds of time living at that bar, live it up, making videos with his white supremacy friends, free as F. Gades Kroskrutz, who was also there, who got shot in the arm, said that Rittenhouse showed a lack of pattern or remorse. I recommend that the bail be raised to $4 million, said Grosskreutz. An attorney for the families, the judge said they couldn't be called victims under a long-standing rule aimed at promoting fairness. We're going we're gonna to watch this clip, so uh, we're going to kind of skip over some of this. Defense attorney Mark Richards said the views were ironic considering her own client had been allowed to enter a sealed address in an unrelated case because another woman jumped in. All right, so let's go out and take a look at some of the statutes here. So uh, this was the 969.03. What am I doing? 969.03. A defendant charged with a felony may be released by the judge without bail or upon execution of an unsecured appearance or bond may require the execution of an appearance bond. Okay, we've already got all that. They can place the person in custody, place restrictions on travel, prohibit the defendant from possessing any dangerous weapons, require the execution of an appearance bond, which he has posted, impose any other conditions, monetary conditions, 
All right. Notice of change of address, 969.10. A person who has been released on bail or other conditions shall give written notice to the clerk. Any change of address within 48 hours. This requirement shall be present, printed on all bonds. All right. And then we've got some other statutes here. Reduction, all release condition stuff. Long story short, judge said, no, we're not going to raise the bond, right? We're not going to raise the bond. Uh, he's, his address is updated. You don't get the address, Mr. Binger. And by the way, you don't get to call the victims of the crime, victims of the crime until there's been an adjudication. What does that mean? Well, in criminal law, there are oftentimes victims of a case. And so there's a lot of contention around this issue. If you have the presumption of innocence, if you are innocent unless proven guilty, then why are you calling people on the other side of the allegation victims if you haven't been proven to be guilty of the crime? Okay, if you punch somebody in the face, allegedly, you're innocent until they can prove you punch somebody in the face. Is the person that got hit in the face, they haven't proven that you've done it yet. You haven't been convicted. You haven't agreed that you've done it yet. If there's that charge, if that allegation is floating around and you're challenging that, you're contesting it. You're saying, no, I did not do that. Somebody else did that. But you're a defendant. You're going through the proceeding. And the court is standing there talking about the other person who got punched in the face. They're saying that person's a victim. And you're going, wait a minute. I haven't been convicted of anything. I didn't hit the guy. He's a victim of somebody, but not me. So why are you referring to that in my case, in my criminal court proceeding? We haven't had a trial. I haven't taken a plea deal. There's been no evidence presented. Don't call him a victim. Call him something else, but he's not a victim in my case. He's a victim of somebody else's case. And so don't prejudice me by, by you know, using this sort of pejorative term of a victim. I didn't, I didn't victimize that person. I'm, I'm innocent. That person got hit by somebody else. I'm going to stand by that. Now, most judges would never even think twice about this, or not most judges, but a lot of judges. They just call them the victims. In fact, in many states, in Arizona, for example, we have a victim's bill of rights. If you are the alleged victim in a case, you get all of these rights. I'm not saying that I disagree with some of those things, but it's, it's just a way of framing the argument where you've already kind of lost. We talked about this yesterday when we were talking about the Democrats and thinking past the sale. And sort of just saying, calling somebody a victim before they've been proven to be a victim of a particular defendant in a particular proceeding. They may be a victim of somebody, but not in this situation. So the judge, as they're having this argument, Thomas Binger is calling them victims. And the judge says, hey, Binger, you know this rule in my court. You've been, it's been a rule for a long time. We don't use that language here, which is... Probably very true, right? This, this guy has probably been practicing in his court for a long period of time, and the judge scolded him a little bit. And I got to tell you, it's kind of nice to see a judge who's down the middle, right? Most of the time I, I see these cases, and it's just like, oh, you want Kyle's address? Sure. You want to know what time he goes to bed? Sure. Uh, what do you have for breakfast? You got it. You get access to all of that. Oh, the victim? Yeah, we're, yes, yes, sir. We're so sorry you lost everything. I know he's a monster, but uh, okay, right? I mean, it's, it's, it can be very biased like that. I'm not even kidding about that. So let's take a look at what is happening here. This was posted over on Twitter by Austin Frisch. More from Kyle Rittenhouse, the judge. In this clip, he exposes a very biased prosecutor. And I agree. I, I, uh, I am not particularly pleased with the level of impartiality that I'm seeing from Thomas Binger. I think he's very angry. He's very motivated. In this case, he's looking for a conviction rather than looking at the evidence, and that's unfortunate for Kyle. But apparently he's, uh, he, he, he's got some new help coming to his defense team. Last I heard, I think Robert Barnes was consulting, so that's not bad news at all. Uh, there, was, there was some question with his prior counsel. I'm happy to see that Robert Barnes is joining the team. It brings another level of confidence, in my opinion, to his team. So let's take a look at this clip. Um, 9608, subsection B, sub, subsection 1. If the court determines that the state has complied with paragraph A, the court may issue a warrant. That's the, that's the limitation on the court's authority to issue a warrant is if the district attorney has complied with paragraph A. And paragraph A is what I just read, and you're missing two of the three ingredients that would be required to empower me to issue a warrant. Unless I'm reading that wrong, and I don't think I am. I understand, Your Honor. I am asking the court to increase the bond, however. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Is that it? Hold on. Mr. Richards? That's all I have, Your Honor. I believe Mr. Motley uh, and 
and a, uh, maybe Attorney Art, also on behalf of the victims, would like to give a, a brief there statement it is. as well. Uh, and I would ask the you, know, you know, you know, you know that I don't permit the use of the term victim before adjudication in this or any other case, and I haven't for years. So please don't use that term. And I know this is an awkward situation, but uh, I, I do not permit the terms victim or uh, alleged victim unless and until there's been an adjudication. Good for him. So these are folks who are speaking on behalf of the uh, families of the deceased. Your Honor, yes. John Huber is the father of Anthony Huber, who was killed by Mr. Rittenhouse, and he's here in yellow, and he would like to address the court if Your Honor will hear from him. Now, this is the mask kerfuffle. Uh, would you identify yourself again, sir? Hello, my name is John Huber, and I am Anthony yeah. Huber's father. Okay, and can, if, would, would you do me the favor if, if it's okay, if there's nobody else there? Uh, it's going to be a lot easier for the court reporter if you remove the mask. I'm going to remove anybody. If he removes his. Uh, I'm not going to, sir. <laughs> sir, I'm talking about the reporter. If I ask Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, All right, here uh, I am. To... Yikes. Yeah, not a good look from Huber's father on that. He says, uh, I'll remove my mask if he removes his. And the judge says, look, man, we're, we're, if there's nobody there, it's better for the court reporter. She can see your lips. She can transcribe this better. Can you, can you just take it off? And so he, you know, he takes it off. And then he, before the judge is done speaking, he says, all right, it's off. Happy. You know, I understand the complexities of Zoom proceedings and talking over one another. But, you know, in a situation like that, when you're making a, a, an appearance before a judge, you just. Yes, your honor. No, your honor. Take the mask off. Here's my you know, he, he looked didn't look good. Frustrated the judge. Prosecutor frustrated the judge. Uh, so this case is getting interesting. Certainly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see where this will ultimately end up. I am glad to see that the judge is kind of holding both sides accountable. I think that this is a good thing for Kyle Rittenhouse. We'll continue to follow along on this story. We spent a lot of time talking about Kyle and we will continue to do so. I think this is a seminal case for self-defense law in this country. It's going to be very interesting to see how it turns out. We hope you join us as we discuss it further. So, all right, let's take a look at some of the questions that have come in. We're going to start the day off with Farmer's Daughter. She says, hey, congrats on the 100K. Thank you, Farmer's Daughter. I appreciate that. I'm super excited about it. I'm giddy. I feel like I'm going to Disneyland tomorrow. What did you think of Bruce Castor's response to the question of Trump winning the vote? I was so happy he didn't take the bait. What I think doesn't matter. It, it matters to me there, Farmer's Daughter. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think you probably asked that question before I played that segment. But I was very glad that he did not accept the bait, right? It, it's, it's outside the scope of the conversation. Did I play that clip? I may not have played that clip. I think that was the one from Bernie Sanders that I did not play. But yeah, he says, no, it's totally outside the scope. We're not even talking about that. Uh, I mean, do you want to talk about incitement? Do you have a question about incitement or insurrection? Because that is not part of it. I thought it was a good move. You know, people are really trying to extend this out into something that I think is really difficult to prove. And it's problematic. You know, if you can take any allegation in this country, any charge, any crime, I mean, it's like, if you, you know, let's say somebody is on trial for a DUI and you say, well, uh, what's their opinion on alcohol? What do they, what, uh, did they drink two months ago? How often do they drink? You know, and you go back six months from now and well, when did they start drinking? And, and you just, you know, you just lump everything that you want into the world, into the scope of the argument rather than exactly what happened on that date, location and time that caused the incitement of the insurrection. No, it, 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 that's a losing argument for them, which is why they have to go and make this big lie sort of conspiracy theory that this was all in motion, that Trump was orchestrating this master plan for three months, two months before the election, and he was colluding to make all of this unfold before our very eyes. It, it, it's outside the scope, and Sanders knows that. The other senators know that, but these are political questions that they want to score political points for in a political show trial. Another one from Farmer's Daughter said, I had to laugh when Senator Nadler claimed he wasn't familiar with Harris's offensive speech when the transcript was read, the record was played, the video was shown. How stupid do they think we are? Very, very stupid. They all think we're very stupid. Thank you, Farmer's Daughter, for if the Supreme Court from Big Dog 1111, if the Supreme Court refused to hear the impeachment case, 
How was it able to proceed when they refused to hear other cases like election fraud? They were thrown out. So it's kind of two different. You're talking about two different tracks, two different roads. The one is a legitimate court of law road where you have civil lawsuits that are filed in uh, federal district courts or state Supreme courts or state local courts or appellate courts or whatever. Uh, and those go through a different process than what you saw with the impeachment proceeding. The impeachment proceeding sort of had this snap impeachment and it happened in a couple quick days in the impeachment in the house of representatives. Once that was done, it was transferred over to the Senate and the senators, the Democrats are in control of that. They get to vote on, on whether or not this was to be heard in the Senate. So it's sort of a political track versus a legitimate legal track. That's why it was heard in the Senate and not heard in the Supreme Court. Now, to, to I think, agree with you a little bit, I would have preferred that the Supreme Court heard some of the election litigation cases before the election even happened. And I was very critical of John Roberts for basically making sure that that didn't happen. So I think that ultimately we're gonna hear maybe some of the election cases, maybe not. I think that the courts are gonna decide whether they're gonna grant Saoirse Rory on some of them very soon. And they may be heard later this year in October when the court's back in session. C. Wolf says, it's a shame that so much effort has been put into showing the Dems own double standards, which they already know. Such a waste of time. This just illustrates their poor judgment and they cannot blindly be trusted they cannot be blindly trusted by the people. Yeah, massive double standard. I mean, if there's a theme for the week, it's just double standards all day long. And it was on display loud and clear for the whole country today. Sharon Quidney in the house says, I think it was important for them to get in and out fast. The Dems wanted to bring up the F word to bait them into getting into that. But my understanding is that they were able to duck that one. Yeah, and I think so. And I think rightfully so. I think that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people wanted to see Trump come in there and just lay out evidence at mounds of evidence about the F word. And that would have muddied the water, in my opinion. You know, that would have been something that really got into the weeds. I think it would have alienated a lot of senators. I think he probably would have been convicted, truthfully, if that happened. But uh, because they're not doing that, they are just sticking to the issues, which is so important if you want to win. I think you can be right or you can win. Trump and his team chose to win. And that was the right call. See the Veil says, would it not be the case where the Dems know they committed the crimes and then being shown their own crimes and the Dems saying, yes, we know, so what? It's too late. You can't do anything about it now. Would it not? Yeah. So, so if you're talking about the F word with the election, you know, I, I don't think that you're ever going to get an acknowledgement like that. Yes, we know, so what? I don't think you're going to get anything like that. I mean, we kind of did get something similar to that. I, I think they were intending it for it to be satire with that Times piece where they just said, yeah, there was a secretive cabal that was manipulating everything. We met with Zuckerberg, met with Dorsey, met with everybody. And, you know, that, that's probably as close as you'll get to an admission. But are you going to get somebody saying, yeah, we took a van from Illinois to New York and we just shoving those ballots in the machines? I don't think you're ever going to see that. Farmer's Daughter says, what did you think of Schumer's little stunt? At the end, by giving a medal to one of the officers there, pretty crafty. So I didn't see that. What did he he gave an officer like an award or something like that? Okay, you can be the judge of what that means. Farmer's daughter says the phone call was mentioned by the defense responding to the claim that it was part of the incitement. His point was, how could it have contributed when it was secretly recorded and released by the governor's office, and Trump had no intention of it being heard by anyone? Okay, so that's probably about the Raffensburger phone call. So I didn't pay much attention to the Raffensburger stuff today. So Farmer's Daughter is saying that uh, basically the defense was that it was secretly recorded and released by the governor's office, which I don't think is much of a defense at all. I think the proper defense would say that was a settlement conference and it was something that was supposed to be held in confidence. It's fine that it wasn't. You can release it. I mean, it's not fine that it wasn't, but it's not criminal what took place. So, uh, okay, if you think it was a phone call that was released sort of... Uh, outside the bounds, that's okay. I mean, it shouldn't have been released. It was a private settlement conference, but it, it, there's nothing illegal in it. So, okay, release it all you want. Put it in the article of impeachment. That's fine. We don't care. It's not an illegal phone call. It's a settlement conference. Trump and his attorneys were there. Raffensperger and his attorneys were there. It wasn't Trump in a dark alley threatening Raffensperger with a gun and saying, you better find those 11,000 votes. It was a settlement conference about election litigation in which you talk about votes because that's what happens in an election. Just like in family court, you talk about custody. In a divorce, you talk about assets. In criminal law, you talk about a sentence, years in prison or probation, right? You talk about those things. In an election litigation, you're going to be talking about votes. And so everybody blew that way out of proportion in my mind. C. Wolf 74 says, 
At what point does the political theater and disinformation go against the public interest? Who could make a case for it? So it's, you know, it's a good question, right? I think you could make the case here today. I was kind of poking fun at this over on Locals. I was saying, wait a minute, Trump just played some videos of the Democrats saying the same things that he said. We already know that the Democrats have defined the things that Trump said as incite, inciting insurrection. And Trump played videos of the Democrats saying those same things. And because Trump hired lawyers and those lawyers played that, that very same dangerous language in front of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans today, Trump is responsible for those statements because he publicly aired them across this entire great country, which means he incited insurrection yet again using the Democrats' own words. He was the mechanism by which their words were promulgated throughout this country. And so, quite frankly, I think Donald Trump should be impeached again as soon as this is over. Impeach him again and again and again and again. Why not? The whole thing's ridiculous. See, Wolf says, what's to protect the public from the mainstream media? Mass deception and disinformation. Can no liabilities be attributed to them? You know, it's it's a very good question. I think there are some pretty big problems, of course, with the media. I've been very critical of it. I have uh, sort of under the belief that they're, what they're trying to do is consolidate, reconsolidate the distribution channels again. I think they do not like that anybody can start a YouTube channel or a podcast. We're seeing ma major moves ac according to their own terms. I mean, you can go on YouTube's blog and they'll, t they'll tell you that if it's borderline content, however that's defined, they don't tell us if it's borderline content then they will bubble up. I forget what the phrase that they use, but they'll, they'll sort of elevate what they consider to be more reputable sources. And what are those sources? It's the big media companies because they don't want an independent journalists out there. I'm not considering myself one of those. I would consider myself more of a commentator, but there are other people out there who are doing independent journalism like Andy NGO and all these, you know, all these other people doing great work out there. And they are not part of that same pillar of the old traditional corporate media. So they have to eliminate them. They got to throw them. They got to cancel their web provider. They got to uh, deplatform them. They got to boycott their providers. You know, there was a couple of years ago, there was a major exodus away from Patreon and many others. And it's going to be just a battle. I mean, that's it. What can the public do? The public can get involved. They can get engaged. They can do things like request Freedom of Information Act uh, requests. They can send those in, get the actual evidence. There's a guy on Twitter by the name of Technofog who has a, a lot of instructions on how to do that. Go check him out if you want to participate in that. Get, get the information directly. Don't get it filtered from the different news media people because it's filtered. They just put their own spin on it and they just kind of dump it out into your face and they expect you to just consume it because they think you're too stupid to think through the issues on your own. So I would encourage you, you know, find alternative sources, find alternative commentators. I listen to a lot of people that I, that I think are interesting, but I don't necessarily disagree with. I'm sorry, agree with. And I listen to them and they'll, they'll provide one perspective and I take a different perspective and I can sort of synthesize my position on an issue in that manner rather than being fed a bunch of headlines from some pre-processed corporate garbage medium. We have C. The Veil says, oh my gosh, seriously, accusing Trump of having protection control over Congress. That is not his job. The House managers are in charge of Congress's security. Congress admitted submission of their office and duties to the president there. Yeah, so uh, that's that's a good point, right? And that was sort of in my negligence block. They're, they're blaming Trump for all of the security failures. He's not responsible for that. There are several different agencies there. There was the Capitol Hill Police, the D.C. Metro Police. We had the National Guard. Many of those resources were refused. That's Trump's fault, unless Trump gave an order. But there was no investigation. If, Donald, if, they, if they had done a real investigation in the House of Representatives and they found that Trump sent five letters to five different agencies and said, don't secure the Capitol building, yeah, that's pretty good evidence. But there is no evidence of that. Otherwise, they would have had it. Sharon Quinney says, hooray, you mean you're finally through with this impeachment stuff? Can't believe it. Sure hope it doesn't come back like the thing that wouldn't die. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're almost through the impeachment stuff. We're going to have a vote hopefully tomorrow. Feisty Lady says, I thought the best clips of the Dems talking about, quote, fighting were the ones where they mentioned they would fight in the streets. Yeah, that, those were good ones. In the streets, they said. And they, actually, they, actually, they also used uh, the word fight like hell. There was a couple people who said that verbatim, the same language that Trump had fighting in the streets. We're going to fight in the courts. We're going to fight in the box, in the, in the polling boxes, and we're going to fight in the streets. And they were fighting in the streets all summer long. 
no condemnations from the media there. She says those that actually referred to physical violence wish they would have had the one of Pelosi when she said she would halt Trump out of the White House by his hair. Yeah, a, a lot of really just bad language. Sharon says regarding the Christian pastor problem. That's not fair. That's not right. It's depriving a person of his right to freedom of religion. Here, here. I agree, I agree with you, Sharon. Not only that, but it's depriving a person of spiritual comfort in one of the most horrible circumstances imaginable. Death penalty is barbaric anyway, but this just makes it so much worse. I agree with you. I think that the death penalty is something we as a society are going to regret immensely 20 years from now. Then we're going to realize that we killed probably a lot more innocent people than anybody wants to admit. And we killed people who are just sick, really sick. And it's going to look like cruel and unusual punishment We'll see what that looks like in 20 years. Jason Segal says, I totally agree that the impeachment defense need not provide a timeline to the prosecutors. Still, I would like to know whether or not Trump had knowledge of the Capitol breach before his tweet about Pence. I agree with you on that, actually. I thought Trump's performance you know, during this was not was not on par. It was not good. Here is one media outlet painting the picture against Trump, but the timeline here is concerning. Yeah. So, you know, this is something that we also, I think I responded to Ryan over on locals today. He had sort of the same point, And I agree. I thought the way Trump handled the media and the tweet after the Capitol Hill riots was just totally ineffective. Now, if you know Trump and I've been following him for a long time, I think he's actually, uh, this is actually one of the reasons he got elected is because he never gives an inch on anything. I mean, anything. He never admits he's wrong on anything. And that I think what the, the same the same thing that got him elected is the same thing that made sure that he was not going to get elected again. It, it's that skill. It's that it's that it's that characteristic. And I call it a skill because I think it is a skill, uh, but you've got to know how to use it and when not to use it. And so what Trump would do, even with the coronavirus, he would just never give an inch on it. Never. We're opening. It's not a big deal. Everything's fine. It's all good because he's a he's a the, the power of positive thinking guy. Right. That's how he operates in this world. And many of these people think that way. Right. They just are sort of out of touch with reality a little bit. Elon Musk doesn't even believe in reality. Right. He just kind of thinks that it, this whole thing might even be a simulation. I'm going to launch a, a, a car into space and then go to Mars and uh, while I'm digging tunnels underneath cities. Right. They're just sort of out there. Steve Jobs was it was renowned that he had this reality distortion field. He would say, I want something and say, it's not possible. Do it anyways. And Donald Trump, I think is cut from the same cloth, whether you believe that or not, but that skill set is not well matched with dealing with the aftermath of Capitol Hill riots that the media was already rushed to blaming him for. You know, he's not going to go out there and say, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, this is horrible. Call it a day, right? Cause he's going to look at that. Like it is, he's on his heels. He's acquiescing. He's giving up some ground and he was never going to do that. It's, it's a, major character flaw, right? That's not a good thing. The way he handled that was not appropriate. That skill stack was also not well in alignment with the response to coronavirus, right? A lot of people wanted more empathy. They wanted more understanding. They wanted more, we're doing things. We know it's hard. And Trump just kind of ignored it. Just, nope, it's no problem. We're opening up. Everything's fine. We're moving on. So a little bit of a mismatch there. I wish I would have seen something different about that uh, from him, but once again, that has nothing to do with the incitement. Okay. All of that was after the fact. You could say he's a piece of garbage after the fact. What does that have to do with him ultimately inciting what happened? It's two different issues. I, I agree. I think it's a, something worth investigating or looking into, but it's not what was on trial that day as much as they tried to make it what was on trial. We have C. Wolf 74 says, Whose interests are really being pursued when Congress is wasting time like this and should know is such with their law degrees and their oaths? So it's their interests. Yeah, I mean, this is this is for them. This is not for the country, in my opinion. Uh, they're going to claim that it is. But what this is, is just a political spectacle. The Republicans wanted to get this over as quickly as possible. That's why their presentation today was two and a half hours. They don't want to talk about it anymore. They want to move it along. The Democrats... They wanted this, this for, for many of them, this was their kind of life work, right? Raskin and Maxine Waters, they were saying for, for years, I think Castro was too, and some others, they've been saying for three or four years, if not longer than that, that they were going to impeach Donald Trump. We're going to get in there and we're going to impeach him. So this is this, this is this them keeping their political promise, right? This is part of what they promise to people when they get elected. We're going to run. Trump's a dictator. He's a Nazi. He's a racist, orange Cheeto puff right? And send me to Congress. I'm going to impeach him. They get sent to Congress in that blue wave in 2022 or before, whenever, whenever, I'm sorry, in uh, 2018 or before that, 
2016. 2017, they're out there on the floor of Congress already screaming they're going to impeach the guy. So it's them fulfilling their promise and it's puffing up their political profile and it's getting them a lot of exposure. They're probably raising a bunch of money off of it and they're, you know, they're going to make a name for themselves. Maybe they'll be named an ambassador somewhere in the Biden administration, but that's all this comes down to. We have Osak says, hey, Rob, great show. Question, how is it that when the Supreme Court rules on something that it becomes law the very next day? Does it affect past law cases and the outcome? Well, yeah, that's what the Supreme Court does. Yeah, they just pass a law and that's that's it <laughs> really uh everybody's got to get in line in, in alignment with it so uh you know we were talking about we I, i'm working on another slide deck for a different case a fourth amendment search and seizure case which i think is scheduled for oral arguments coming up very soon and yeah i mean a lot of defense attorneys are just sort of on edge what what's going to happen here the supreme court's going to come down we've got a circuit split about whether or not the police can can sort of get into your home without a warrant using this exception to the warrant requirement called the caretaker exception it's a, it's an exception that exists for your car where they can basically get access to search your car but there are many different uh, governments around our country are now saying that that applies to your home this caretaker exception was a, was a a very pernicious thing where they said that they can just get access to your car. They want to apply that same thing to your house. It's a big deal. So the Supreme Court right now, there's a circuit split about half the circuits say that's okay. The other half of the circuit say that's not okay. Supreme Court's going to come out and tell us. And at, at that moment, half the court, half the circuit courts, that's not going to be okay anymore. And so there's going to be a lot of cases that are using that exception that are probably going to get dismissed the next day because the Supreme Court updated what the rules are. We have Farmer's Daughter says, Solemnity. There we go. Solemnity? Solemnity. The state or quality of being serious and dignified. Solemnity. I'm feeling very solemn right now. We have Sharon says, Why do people talk about closure for the victim's family when talking about capital punishment? Authentic, authentic closure only comes when you're able to forgive the one who has harmed you. Yes, Sharon. Yes, Exactly right. You know, if you have been living since 1991, when this guy killed your loved one, it with just this resentment for the last 30 years, that is, I'm sorry for that person, right? I would hope that they could forgive and they could let those resentments go. And I know people will say, well, you haven't lost somebody like that. Okay. If you say so. But my point is, it's about forgiveness. It's about letting it go. If you just walk around with this boiling resentment the rest of your life, it's going to kill you. It's not, it's not good. And so I think that the cap, you know, the, the, the death penalty, I think that is a poor excuse for killing somebody. But what can you say? Cattle caregiver says, I'm pro death penalty. If it's 110% certain they committed the murder, but I have to side with Amy. Seems like a no brainer to allow your pastor there at your side at the end of your earth's journey, especially if you're dealing with the guilt of unfairly ending an innocent person's life. Yeah. I mean, isn't that, isn't that what we want? Don't we want repentance? Don't we want redemption? Don't we want people to be absolved of their sins? Or do we just have to just eternally punish people into the eternal depths of hell for all of the rest of the universe? It's just a little, a little much. C. Wolf says, what are assurances that the public interest will be upheld when there are conflicts between interests, a, a politician's party and his or her constituents or the public? Well, I think, honestly, C. Wolf, the answer is, well, I can come in a couple different forms, right? You can say that the, uh, the FEC, the Federal Elections Committee Commission, you know, they're looking at donations and, and fundraising and those things. So you could argue that maybe they're working on the, the integrity of the political class. But I think it's it's a it's a this is why we have elections, right? This is why we have votes. When a politician and their work gets out of alignment with the interests of the public, they gotta go. And it's time to refresh that particular seat. Osak says, Rob, how can the death penalty still be allowed? I used to be for it, but after seeing countless numbers of cases overturned, it shows a flaw in the system. With death being the ultimate punishment, would it be a better to do away with it? Thought it's better to let 100 people, guilty people go than one innocent person in. Yeah, I think the death penalty is probably, you know, it's probably on its way to being phased out. I think more and more people are realizing that it's it's not, you know, I, I just don't know what the public policy benefits are for it there. And this is, I used to be a pro, pro, pro death penalty person, pro. I told you when I was in law school, when I was a first year law school student, I was like Mr. Prosecutor. You know, I thought I was going to be like, Harvey Specter or something like that, you know, out there just prosecuting people, doing justice in this world. And uh, then I started to deal with people 
who are going through the justice system and I learned they're good people. They just need help. And many of them are broken. And I just, I still can't really, I think back through a lot of my other prior capital punishment arguments about, um, I can't even really remember what they are because they're not any good, <laughs> they're not any good arguments. Uh, I, I, I think that Osaka gets probably on its way out, which is good news. Ma Fox says, well, to be fair, Robert, they have been very vocal about themselves using an affirmative defense. They're not saying Kyle didn't do it. As they talked about in the preliminary hearing, there was no argument that Kyle was not Kyle, nor that Kyle didn't shoot anyone. So, yes, so you're, you're exactly right, Ma. So Ma's talking about an affirmative defense, right? And he's saying that they're not saying Kyle didn't do it. They talked about, as they talked about in the preliminary hearing, there was no argument that Kyle was not Kyle, nor that Kyle didn't shoot anyone. Okay, yes, so that's, that's right. Ma Fox is exactly right. So what Kyle and his team is doing is they're using a, a self-defense argument, which is a, an affirmative defense. So they're not, an affirmative defense is saying, yes, we know that happened, but this is why it's not criminal. In this case, yes, we know Kyle shot three people, but it's not murder because it was self-defense. He was being chased by several people and he was firing the weapon in self-defense. So it's acknowledging the underlying thing happened. So another example might be a, uh, a DUI case. Okay. Somebody is, uh, take some sleeping pills. They go to bed, they wake up and their wife is dying. She's having a heart attack or a stroke. So the person who took some prescription medication, maybe let's, you can throw alcohol in there too. Say he, he was drinking that night as well. Wife is dying right there in front of him. He's in a rural area where the ambulance won't get there. So he throws his wife in the car, is racing her to the hospital, gets pulled over, stopped, charged with DUI. The other, uh, another officer hauls his wife into the hospital. She lives miraculously, okay? And the prosecutor there is saying, well, you're driving under the influence. That's technically illegal. The defense would say, well, look, we were under duress. This was an emergency. This was a, sort of an exception to the standard rule. I, I'm acknowledging that I was driving under the influence. I'm acknowledging that I was under the influence of alcohol plus a prescription drug. I'm I know technically that's illegal under the law, but we have an affirmative defense called duress or uh, whatever whatever the rule is in that in that particular state. You, you know, find one of those, and that's the excuse. That's the defense. I, I know I was doing it, but this relieves me of criminal liability because the law says so. And so that's what Kyle's doing, and it's a, it's a good point, right? Uh, thank you, Ma, for that. We got Sharon says, regarding the Kyle case, I agree completely that it was totally prejudicial to use the victim language. I wish other judges were more fair. Yeah, I like that judge a lot. I thought that he was very, very even keeled there. And you just don't see that a lot, unfortunately. What happens when the real victim in a case is accused of the crime and later found out to be the victim after all? Is there any justice for that person or is it tough s deal with it? So, yeah, so the, so, so yeah, once a person is, adjudicated to have been guilty for that. So let's, you know, let's say in Rittenhouse's case that he's found guilty, which I don't think that he will be. We'll see. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a, a very interesting trial. It's almost a wild trial. And I, I realized that was insightful language. So I didn't say that, but it here, if, if Kyle is ultimately convicted, then it, it will, it will confirm that they were the victim of his murder. Okay. They are, they are the survivors of a decedent of the deceased, somebody who died. But was that, was that criminal liability? I mean, did Kyle, was that wrong? Or were they responsible for their death and Kyle was justified in using self-defense to kill them because they were attacking Kyle? If it's determined legally that Kyle murdered them, in other words, the self-defense doctrine doesn't save him, then there would be a victim and they would be entitled to the penalty. They would get to go and speak at his sentencing. They could say, we want... Uh, him to go to prison forever. They could say we want restitution. We want, you know, a million dollars for the death of our son and they can make a restitution claim and the judge could order restitution so that when Kyle gets out in 25 years, he's got to pay him back, whatever, right? There's a lot of things that they can, that, that can happen to them to be compensated um, at the end of it. But you got to, you got to answer the first question. Okay. It's almost like the impeachment in, in the impeachment stuff. They just wanted to punish Trump without proving that he caused the damage. Same type of thing is, is happening here. The judge is not letting it go on that way, though. XN Drew says the prosecutor is out of line. I do have a belief that Kyle was in the wrong, but I was not there and I'm not a public official. Kyle's case is very political, but he still has rights. He is in real danger. Good point there, XN Drew. 
Chairman of the board in the house says, maybe my bias on this situation is showing, but I thought today was a mic drop moment or moments. I really liked how a couple of times the defense lawyer asked a rhetorical question and just literally stared at the senators. Yeah, we saw that. And we saw that. Uh, I played that clip of, I think it was Vanderween who did that. He just grabbed his notebook and just walked right out of there. He said, there's no due process here. Grabbed his ball and he left. And I thought that was, that was fun. I know there was not a response expected nor would one be appropriate in that situation, but the silence was deafening. Yeah, there was, I agree with, I don't think your bias is showing on that. I think, Chairman, that's exactly what he was intending to do. You know, it was, it, it's, it's almost theater, right, when you go into a trial like that. As a defense lawyer, as a prosecutor, as any attorney, you got to put on a show a little bit. And of course, he was doing that. Joe Snow says the Times article use of alarming verbiage is disinformation, in my opinion, designed to throw people off of the scent of corruption of the actual elite, the uniparty plaguing D.C. It's a good point, Joe. You know, I think it was intended to sort of be a, a needle in the eye of some people who are looking for this. I mean, they wrote it that way for a reason. I think that they I, you know, I don't know what the author was trying to do. I can't read their minds. But to me, it felt like it was it was almost satirical. It's like Trump says that there was a cabal of people. So we're going to call him a cabal and watch this. We're going to put it in this huge article and we're actually going to tie it to legitimate facts that we have about John Podhertz and all these other people who were kind of doing exactly what they said. And we're just going to mash it all in and we're just going to cram it down their throats and see how they like it. And people, myself included, we all we all looked at it. and We said, yeah, there it is. This is what we've been talking about. This is exactly what we were saying, right, for a long period of time. And. Is anything going to happen? Is anybody going to do anything? Are any of these Republican Congress people going to say, hey, maybe we should investigate some of this stuff or figure out what to do about any of this? Or this is just how it goes. So you have now you have some new people to blame for that. And the regular operators, the, the politicians on both sides of the party uh, of the aisle, they're just going to move forward with the status quo like nothing even happened. Unfortunately. We say here, we got Farmer's Daughter says, do you think if he had acquiesced to the Dems would not have gone after him for the impeachment? While I agree his behavior wasn't in his best interest, I don't think it would have mattered. They want his head no matter what. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, Trump was getting impeached, I think, regardless of what his response was looking like. We have Ma Fox said there are cases where self-defense is an affirmative defense for two opposing parties, legally speaking. While substantially more rare, I still believe the person who ends up injured or killed is a victim, despite if it was legally justified. And it's really wonky when both parties can be justified. Yeah, so I mean, look, yeah, so I think I think the issue here is sort of distinguishing whose victim is that, right? Like, of course, of course, a dead person is a victim, right? Of, uh, of, of, it's a loss, right? So you just have to be careful about that definition. They, they were killed. Legally, are they a victim of Kyle Rittenhouse? Not yet. They're sort of a, a victim in the broad sense of the term, right? And, but, but, Legally, were they a victim of Kyle Rittenhouse? No, that has not been proven yet. But yes, they were a victim of, of the circumstances. They were a victim of the civil unrest. They were a victim of the high tension that exists in this country surrounding these criminal justice issues. And so I think the judge is recognizing that, but he's just saying, look, don't, don't call him a, a victim here in this court right now because it hasn't been proven yet. And it's a little bit too prejudicial towards Mr. Rittenhouse. It's sort of too much thinking past the sale. It's too much of presumption that he, he, he criminally killed them versus killed them out of self-defense and the judge is just leaving, leaving that open. And I appreciate that. And it, you're right, it is wonky when both parties can be justified. Then you have just sort of two people uh, pointing their fingers at each other, self-defense on self-defense, and uh, those issues can be hard to sort out. Feisty Lady says, considering all the mass confusion at the Capitol on all sides, protesters, officers, Congress members, I doubt even if Trump could have immediately tweeted or broadcast, no one really would have been paying attention to hear it. I can't imagine how many different confusing reports were also coming into the White House simultaneously. It takes valuable time to sort out what's really happening. And yeah, that's a good one to end up with there, Feisty Lady. And I agree with you, you know, and, and so I've sort of been a little bit lenient on, on, the, on the former president, the 45th president, as he calls himself, uh, for that regard. You know, he was, he was there and the, 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 remember, the Capitol was bring, being breached before he was even done speaking. Okay, he was still going on with his speech as it was happening. So by the time he's finished talking, now he's you know being transported, probably briefed. They, you know, he said he was going to go walk over there with him. Then he didn't walk over there with him. They probably brought him back to the White House and secured him up. And they figured, you know, it was a, it was a mess. 
You had Capitol Hill Police, Metro Police, National Guard, Sergeant of Arms. You had a lot of people trying to figure out what the heck was going on. And so, you know, you can you can understand that a higher priority there would be before you get out there and start tweeting something would be to facilitate the federal government's response to what was happening. And so, you know, we don't know, we don't know what that looked like. Now, there's a lot of stories from people like the Washington Post, which I don't trust at all at this point, that they, they basically were saying that, no, he was gleeful and like doing cartwheels in the White House and, uh, you know, having a mimosa watching all of this happen on the TV. And you're going, come on, guys, really? So I don't, you, know, you have to take everything, I think, with a grain of salt. When he ultimately did give his recorded statement, I still thought that that was a little too much. You know, I would have liked to have seen him just said, all right, listen, don't have to talk about the election fraud. Don't have to, jo- uh, to talk about why he loves certain people. Just say, listen, this is not acceptable to our country. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. Everybody stand down, go home. We're going to sort this stuff out at a later date. Anybody who refuses to leave, you are going to be dealt with with haste. Okay, I've ordered X, Y, and Z. Stop it. Um, I think that would have been a more appropriate statement. Then the next day, he can figure out what really happened there. And um, that would have been a better response. But that was it. That was our last one from Miss Feisty Lady. Thank you, Feisty Lady, for being here. As you know, as you have probably seen, we've t- taken all of those questions from our platform over at Locals. Locals.com slash watching the watchers or this address called watching the watchers.locals.com. I want to thank everybody who is supporting us over there. I know I go into this at the end of the show. I'm sure people bail out of it right now, but I want to thank you for helping us build this separate platform. It's an independent platform. It, we're not connected to any any one particular platform. In terms of our content, I think that there's a lot more free speech protection over there at Locals.com. So I'd encourage you to go check that out. And I want to thank those of you who do. Down here at the bottom, who always gets covered up by me, is Fish Cat. And we got Takahara Seji, who I have not seen around lately. Where's Taki? We got Chris Wiseman in the house. We got Loxton. We got Ditka's Bears, Ronnie D. Some other ones, CLRO, GFF. We have have, uh, Tani13, Cax Axe on the house, Irvius, CRS, Lena, R. Goodson. We got Wise One. Michelle Monique. Then we got some new people who signed up yesterday. We had Jax842, Dev613, Peggy G, Peggy Penny, T I G. We got I'm a Lemon. And then we have some, we have, oh, we got a handful of new people who signed up last night. Awesome. We got Arctu, Arcturians signed up, Lollipop Doc in the house, Ugly Ducklin signed up. We got Judy Utah, Power Man signed up, and Big Dog1111 also joined the party. And so thank you, everybody for heading on over to Locals and joining us over there. If you have not already been there, there's a lot of good stuff there. In addition to uh, being able to post the questions just like we went through, you can also grab a copy of my book. It's called Beginning to Winning. There's a free PDF over there. It's a, in a pinned post to the very top. You can also buy a copy on Amazon if you'd like, but you can get it for free there. The slides that I went through today are also going to be there. The impeachment party template is there probably this is probably going away after this week folks so get it while it's hot you can grab a copy of my existence systems and my personal productivity tool i did a video about this on january 1st you can check that out if you want it it's totally free you can download this document and modify it to your heart's desire we share links and we also have good conversation but the real real reason to be over there is of course the great people many good good individuals great conversation talking about a lot of important issues And that's it for me. I want to remind you also, if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona who has been charged with a crime, that's what we do here at our law firm. We help good people who've been charged with crimes find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and in their futures. We're very good at what we do. We help people with things like DUIs, misdemeanor offenses, felony offenses, major felony offenses, everything in between. If you've got an open case, a closed case that you want to clean up, an old warrant that you need to quash, if you have a a case that you want to restore your rights on so you can vote again, possess a firearm, apply for federal benefits. We can help you with all of that. We can help remove mug shots off the internet. There's a lot we can do. We want to make sure that you get through the justice system and get back into life with the minimal amount of harm possible. And we're good at it. So we offer free case evaluations. If you or anyone you know or love needs our help, we'd be honored and humbled if you would send them our way. We'd uh, we'd very much appreciate it. We'll make sure we take good care of them. Uh, quick show note, I'm planning on doing a live stream tomorrow for the Digital Bill of Rights. Not sure what time. It's probably going to be earlier than it was last Saturday. I'm thinking about 3 p.m.-ish. So sort of mentally bookmark that in your mind. I've gotten a ton of feedback from our last session on last Saturday. So what I'm going to do is sort of incorporate that 
into a second round of this. I've got some suggestions for additional amendments. I've got some feedback on some likes and dislikes from different amendments. I've got some other resources. And so we're going to, I'm going to spend tonight and tomorrow morning sort of organizing it. And then we're going to go through it tomorrow again at about 3 p.m. ish. So keep that in mind. If you want to be around, I will schedule it. You'll see that. I'll also post a notification there on Locals. So that's it, my friends. It is Friday. So I want to let you get back to your evening. Everybody sleep very well. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I will see some of you tomorrow. Otherwise, I'll see you back here on Monday. Same time, same place, 5 p.m. Arizona time, 4 p.m. in California on the West Coast, 6 p.m. Central in Texas, 7 p.m on the East Coast and for that one Florida man. I will see everybody very soon. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.